in the course of the proceedings. If at any moment it appears that the guidelines are not being strictly observed, the President will have no choice but to draw the attention of delegates to these guidelines or even suspend or adjourn the meeting as needed. Furthermore, I would like to remind delegates attending this meeting that under the new COVID-19 contact tracing, existing building access cards are being used to record presence of attendees in the meeting rooms. In addition to swiping cards to gain access to the UNHQ premises, delegates and UN personnel are also requested to swipe access cards at the entrance of conference rooms. The information collected will only be used in case of a need for COVID-19 contact tracing and not for any other purpose. The data will be held for a maximum of 28 days. Thank you. I call to order the high-level interactive dialogue on antimicrobial resistance. This high-level interactive dialogue is a follow-up to, to a call of the General Assembly in its resolution 74-2 and of 10 of October 2019, entitled Political Declaration of the High-Level Meeting on Universal Health Coverage. It will 
focus on strengthening political commitment, taking stock of progress, committing to actions and building back better from COVID-19 by agreeing further practical steps that can effectively address challenges to tackling antimicrobial resistance as part of future pandemic preparedness through a One Health approach while supporting the delivery of the sustainable development goals. I warmly welcome all of you to this meeting. I'll make my opening statement uh, from the rostrum. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Antimicrobial resistance is one of the greatest threats facing our planet. It is already affecting us today, and its potential is devastating. Speaking in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, I do not say this lightly. We are all now acutely aware of the impacts of a health crisis. COVID-19 has caused the biggest global emergency in the United Nations history. We ignore AMR at our peril. The overuse and misuse of antimicrobials in humans, animals, and agriculture has driven up resistance in the microorganisms these medicines are meant to fight. AMR threatens to make the medicines we rely on to keep us, or animals and plants, healthy redundant. It threatens to take us backwards and undo many medical advancements. We are already running out of effective treatments for several common infections. Currently, an estimated 700,000 people die each year due to drug-resistant diseases. And with few replacement products in the pipeline, we are moving towards a post-antibiotic era in which common infectious disease will once again cause mortality. None of the 43 antibiotics currently in development are enough to combat the increasing emergence and spread of antimicrobial resistance. If current trends continue, sophisticated interventions like organ transplantation, joint replacements, cancer chemotherapy, and care of preterm infants uh, that all require antimicrobials will become too dangerous and will no longer be possible. If no action is taken, drug-resistant diseases could cause 10 million deaths each year by 2050, and damage to the economy will be as catastrophic as the 2008-2009 global financial crisis. By 2030, AMR could force up to 24 million people into extreme poverty. Despite its devastating consequences, there is a startling lack of awareness about this silent pandemic. AMR challenges the effective delivery of the Sustainable Development Goals. Lack of regulation, the use of antibiotics as growth promoters in animals, over-the-counter and internet sales have sparked a boom in counterfeit or poor quality antimicrobials. As the largest consumer of antimicrobials, it is critical that stakeholders involved in food production, food processing, animal husbandry, and agriculture are included in discussions on AMR. The launch of the New One Health Global Leaders Group on Antimicrobial Resistance in November 2020 is to be commended. I urge all member states to engage meaningfully with the Global Leaders Group and FAO, OIE, WHO, Tripartite Collaboration on AMR to strengthen global governance and coordination in fighting against AMR. Global leaders can help to catalyze global attention and action to preserve antimicrobial medicines and tackle AMR. Excellencies, dear colleagues, the COVID-19 pandemic has increased the risk of AMR, 
across the globe, but it has also demonstrated what we are capable of. In just a year, we have developed multiple vaccines that are being rolled out globally. We have supported increased humanitarian needs. It is clear to me that when we work together, we can effectively address global challenges. A concerted global approach led by heads of state and global institutions with coordinated action by the health and agricultural sectors in partnership with the food industry, campaign groups, and community organizations in context of One Health and 2030 Agenda is the only way to tackle AMR. I welcome the ambitious and action-oriented nature of the call to action, which has now been endorsed by our 100 countries, demonstrating the wide support across the membership. As we have seen with the COVID-19 pandemic, when there is political will, we can achieve remarkable results. I encourage member states to develop and implement national action plans on AMR, strengthen regulation on antimicrobials, improve knowledge and awareness, and promote best practices, as well as foster innovative approaches using alternatives to antimicrobials and new technologies for diagnosis and vaccines. Effective communication, education, and training is critical to raise awareness and encourage expert-driven behavior change. Multi-stakeholder partnerships are key. The private sector, doctors, medical workers, farmers, the food industry, and regulators, as well as consumers, are critical partners in this battle. I call on the pharmaceutical industry, public, private, and philanthropic donors and other funders to increase investment and innovation into new quality-assured antimicrobials, in particular antibiotics, and promote and support equitable and affordable access to existing and new quality-assured antimicrobials. As with so many crises, it is the vulnerable who stand to be most affected by AMR. Stronger systems are needed to monitor drug-resistant infections and to volume of antimicrobials used in humans, animals, and crops. We need to understand the issue to solve it. A coordinated approach to increase investment across the One Health spectrum and implementation of national action plans is urgently needed. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, before concluding, it would be remiss of me not to discuss universal health coverage. Expanding UHC will help to ensure the core components of a health system are in place. And if adequately resourced, this can help expand the coverage of measures to prevent and manage infection, including the appropriate use of antibiotics. I look forward to hearing from you at this interactive dialogue today. I encourage you to use this opportunity to strengthen political commitment, take stock of progress, and demonstrate actions to build back better from COVID-19. We will hear from you, the member states, and a wide range of partners as you share perspectives and highlight solutions on challenges and opportunities to tackling AMR as part of future pandemic preparedness through a One Health approach while supporting the delivery of the SDGs. Excellencies, dear friends, dear colleagues, let me leave you with one thought. Next time you consider using antimicrobials or are offered a meal treated by antimicrobials, consider the impact your decision will have on your grandchildren's access to these life-saving drugs. We can no longer take them for granted. We have to act now to safeguard the progress we have already achieved. Thank you.
I now invite the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Her Excellency Amina Mohamed, to make a statement. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, two years ago, the Interagency Coordination Group on Antimicrobial Resistance submitted its final report to the Secretary General, giving practical guidance for sustained effective global action on this critical subject. Today, we meet to take stock of progress and reinvigorate momentum around our collective response to antimicrobial resistance. Two years ago, the world was a very different place. As a global community, we have been shaken to the core by the COVID-19 pandemic. We have witnessed firsthand the devastating impact of hard to treat infections and the ease with which they can spread and threaten global health. If no action is taken, the fallout from the silent pandemic of antimicrobial resistance could be of the same or greater magnitude. Rising levels of AMR are making infections in humans, animals, and plants harder to treat. They threaten recent gains in global health, food security, economic growth, and sustainable development. No health system will be sustainable without access to affordable antibiotics at work. But the problem is now aggravated because the pipeline for the development of new classes of antibiotics is almost empty. AMR will make the attainment of the universal health coverage more challenging due to increased health care costs, and medicines will cost more, treatments will take longer, and cures will be less certain. Protracted illness will disproportionately affect women, who are the primary caregivers in most instances. To effectively address antimicrobial resistance, countries need robust systems to prevent and manage infections in humans and animals, and they need to support the prudent and responsible use of antimicrobials. This requires sustained action across sectors. The Global Action Plan on AMR adopted by the World Health Assembly in 2015 and subsequently endorsed by FAO and OIE governing bodies calls for all countries to develop and implement multi-sectoral national action plans. But there is an urgent need to step up support and critical investments to scale up AMR responses at national, regional and global levels. At the 2016 UN high-level meeting on AMR, global leaders committed to tackling antimicrobial resistance and called upon the tripartite to scale up through a one health approach. Actions to address antimicrobial resistance at country level will be strengthened by the tripartite and UNEP. For instance, the AMR multi-partner trust fund has enabled the tripartite to support 11 low and middle income countries to implement their one health national plans. By strengthening reinvigorated and integrated surveillance. AMR regulatory and legislative frameworks and infection prevention have also been strengthened. In addition, agencies and organizations such as UNDP, UNICEF, and the World Bank have critical roles to play. UN country teams also stand ready to support countries in the inclusion of AMR in the UN Sustainable Development Corporation frameworks. Supporting the global fight against antimicrobial resistance strengthens the resilience of health systems and should be included in global health security and pandemic preparedness efforts. These are critical for getting us back on track to achieve the SDGs by 2030. I very much look forward to our deliberations and a renewed shared plan of action to address antimicrobial resistance. I thank you. I thank the Deputy Secretary General for her statement. I now invite the Assembly to review the pre-recorded statement of Her Excellency Sheikh Hasina, Prime Minister of the People's Republic of Bangladesh and co-chair of the One Health Global Leaders Group on Antimicrobial Resistance. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Honorable President of the UN General Assembly, Honorable Prime Minister of Barbados, Excellencies, Assalamu Alaikum and good morning. I would like to thank the President of the General Assembly for convening this high-level dialogue on 
antimicrobial resistance, AMR. I am happy to join this dialogue as co-chair of the Global Leaders Group on AMR for promoting multisectoral collaboration to combat the contain AMR. Distinguished guests, the world is now witnessing the devastating pandemic of COVID-19. However, antimicrobial resistance may cause even more lethal pandemics in future. Failure to tackle this hazard in time will result in huge loss of human lives, animals, and plants. According to an estimate by the WHO, 10 million people will die every year by 2050 from AMR. And economic loss would be in trillions of dollars, which will also disrupt food security and progress towards achievement of the SDGs and universal health coverage. Excellencies, in Bangladesh, we have developed a six-year national strategic plan and national action plan on antimicrobial resistance containment, ARC. Moreover, the National Technical Committee on ARC and the Bangladesh AMR Response Alliance were formed. Laboratory-based AMR surveillance for both human and animal health is being conducted regularly to ensure WHO categorization similarly from 2019, we have been providing AMR surveillance data to WHO class platform. Ladies and gentlemen, addressing the challenges of AMR is crucial for preventing future pandemics. We need to implement the 2015 Global Action Plan on AMR 2016 UN Political Declaration on AMR and formulate AMR National Action Plans. As co-chairs of the Global Leaders Group on AMR, the Prime Minister of Barbados and I stand ready to work with all relevant stakeholders in contributing to the fight against AMR. Excellency, I would like to end by stressing on the importance of the following five actions. Number one, integrated multi-sectoral action plan on AMR, including collective action plan by the international community at both regional and global level with special focus on low and middle income countries. Number two, good manufacturing laboratory practices and surveillance framework. Number three, equitable access to affordable and effective antibiotics as required through transfer of technology and sharing of ownership. Number four, sustainable financing for AMR containment activities. Number five, finally, global public awareness in combating AMR through political commitment and partnership among the member states. I thank you all. I thank the Prime Minister of the People's Republic of Bangladesh for her statement. I now give the floor to Her Excellency Mia Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados and co-chair of the One Health Global Leaders Group on Antimicrobial Resistance, who has joined us to a live video link. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Excellencies all. I want to thank you, Mr. President, for hosting this high-level segment and to all my sister, the Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed for also being graceful enough, gracious enough to join us this morning. I want to express my enthusiastic support, as I said, for also the attendance of the other heads of institutions with whom we have been working on this matter. 
The Global Leaders Group performs an independent global advisory and advocacy role with the objective of maintaining urgency, public support, political momentum, and visibility of the MR challenge on the global agenda. Our mission is to work globally with governments, agencies, civil society, and the private sector to promote a One Health approach and to advocate for political action on responsible and sustainable access to and use of antimicrobials and the mitigation of drug-resistant infections. And what is this? After all, it is, as has been dubbed, the slow-motion pandemic that threatens to reverse a century of medical progress. I am pleased, therefore, to see the participation of the GLG members in each of the four panels today. Securing sustainable financing, taking stock of national and global progress, and building back better, or building forward better, I should say, from COVID, are all critical in the fight against AMR. And these themes certainly align with the priorities of the Global Leadership Group. From hospitals and homes, to farms and factories, the misuse and the overuse of antimicrobial agents, together with unsanitary living and working conditions, threaten a wave of drug resistance and resistant infections that imperil humans, animals, our food supply, our commerce, and of course, our environment. The challenges of antimicrobial resistance, my friends, are complex and multifaceted, but they are not insurmountable if we act with solidarity and commitment today. I would like to take this opportunity to call on all leaders globally to be champions of AMR. We have all experienced the health, the social and the economic impact of this awful COVID-19 pandemic. But we can also see the opportunity that it presents us to address the issue of antimicrobial resistance, which threatens literally to be the greatest killer of human beings by the year 2050. And how do we do it? By integrating the response to AMR into future pandemic response and into our preparedness plans, as you've heard from all who have spoken before me. We cannot, we cannot afford to let this opportunity pass us by. Political will, as usual, is critical. We need leadership from the top. But leadership must also come from the grassroots in order to convey the gravity of the situation and to activate leaders and to bring about change. Because we must ask ourselves, what will move the needle? What will move the needle to the changes in individual behavior as it relates to the taking and the overuse of antibiotics or indeed to using food that is as a result of improper practices? What will it take to move the needle with respect to the whole issue of corporate investment such that we can have the appropriate um, pharmaceuticals necessary to be able to fight the difficult, the difficult um, strains that may come? And what is necessary to move the needle in terms of global action? Let us work, my friends, across our communities and countries, across health workers, farmers, and civil society, across businesses, so that together we can help preserve antimicrobials for future generations. What is needed now is simple language, effective communication, and absolute political leadership. I thank you. I thank the, I thank the Prime Minister Barbados for her statement. I also wish to thank the Deputy Secretary General for taking the time to be with us this morning. The Deputy Secretary General will now be leaving for another engagement. I now give the floor to Mr. Ku Dong Yu, Director General of the Food and Agricultural Organization, who has joined us through a live video link. Excellency, good morning, good afternoon from Rome. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I thank the President of the General Assembly for inviting me to this important and very timely dialogue today, as we are indeed at a tipping point. Due to the anti-mail resistance, AMR, drug resistance, infection, other plates in the ever increase, and the, all these uh, issues uh, uh, burden to the human, animals, and the environment. AMR, 
is becoming more and more visible, complex threat to the global health, food safety, food security, and also potentially uh, influence the, all the uh, uh, interface, the uh, leading to the substantial social economic damage. But we can turn this around if we make it coherent, swiftly, and decisively. We needed to keep antimicrobial working. Simply waiting for new drugs is not an option because of the extraordinary cost and the complexity of the research and the development. Without effective efficiency medicines, the spread of the infectious disease threatens to the escalate out of the control. FO expected a 45% rise in the global demand for animal protein by 2050. So we must face the double challenge of meeting this increase in demand while reducing the risk of AMR. Speed up the 2030 agenda for sustainable development through the transform to more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food systems. To strengthen the multi-sector collaboration, support the capacity building, and promote the prudent and responsible use of antimicrobial crosses agro and food sectors. Addressing MR threat requires collective efforts from the, a wide range of stakeholders, including ministers of health, food, agriculture, and those responsible for the stewardship of our shared natural resources, including academic and private sectors. I'm encouraged by the increased number of members who have uh, introduced uh, exemplary policies, other undertaking concrete action and uh, demonstrating a strong political willingness to combat AMR. The chief partner of FAO, WHO, and OIE, together with UAEB and others, to work together and to mobilize the movement for change by providing adequate mechanisms so that the stakeholders from across the world can come together in shaping the vision and ambitions of the collective action. Making mechanisms such as Global Leaders Group, GL, G on AMR, and the Partnership Platform for Action Against AMR, and other more effective. Ladies and gentlemen, to achieve the impact, we need to promote the effective and co coordinated One Health approach at all levels, involving all related party, parties. This means involving, moving from the high-level conversation to practical action on the ground to bring changes. To accelerate the needed action, Chief Partner calls for more funds, income, contributions, and resources to scale up the operation globally and at the country level. Only by working together, our world will be better for generations to come. We can build back better and stronger for better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life, leaving no one behind. We are determined to noble mission for one health world without hunger and poverty. I thank you, President. Over I, to you. I thank the Director General of the Food and Agricultural Organization for his statement. I now give the floor to Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, Director General of the World Health Organization, who has joined us to a video, live video link. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Your, Excellen Your Excellency Prime Minister Mia Motley, Your Excellency Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, Your Excellency President Volkan Bozkir, DSG Amina Mohammed, Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends. COVID-19 has demonstrated the devastating impact on health, societies, and economies of a microbe for which we have no treatments or vaccines. But the pandemic has also shown the challenges in mounting a coordinated global response to a global threat. The same is true for antimicrobial resistance. It's vital that together we harness the same urgency, the same innovation, and the same solidarity we have seen in the face of COVID-19 to confront antimicrobial resistance and address the challenges we have faced in response to the, to the pandemic. 
We're grateful to have Her Excellency Mia Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, and Her Excellency Sheikh Hasina, Prime Minister of Bangladesh, co-chairing the One Health Global Leaders Group on Antimicrobial Resistance, which is playing an essential role in advocating for urgent action to combat the threat of AMR. I thank them for their leadership. Throughout Joint Tripartite Secretariat, through the, our Joint Tripartite Secretariat on AMR, we have been working closely with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the World Organization for Animal Health, and the UN Environment Program to respond to the global threat of AMR. This multi-sectoral partnership is essential to our efforts. The COVID-19 pandemic has been a harsh illustration of the need to work across sectors with a One Health approach that integrates efforts to protect the health of humans, animals, and our planet. The COVID-19 pandemic has also demonstrated the urgency to address a glaring weakness in our health systems around the world, the lack of water and sanitation. Health workers in one third of the world's health facilities have nowhere to wash their hands at points of care. Without infection prevention and control, we cannot hold the spread of AMR. This is why we're also encouraged to see a new indicator in the Sustainable Development Goals on bloodstream infections for AMR included as part of strengthening capacity in countries. This is particularly important in supporting the efforts of low and middle income countries for early warning and management of national and global health risks. In closing, I urge all countries to sign on to the 2021 call to action on antimicrobial resistance. It has already gathered significant support. It's urgent that nations around the world come together to commit and follow through on the global struggle to stop to stop AMR. I thank you. I thank the Director General of the World Health Organization for his statement. I now give the floor to Dr. Monique Elway, Director General of the World Organization for Animal Health, who has joined us through a live video link. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear panelists, good afternoon from Paris. Allow me firstly to thank you, Mr. President, for bringing together the participants of this dialogue meeting. In the presence of the co-chairs of the One Health Global Leaders Group, Her Excellency Sheikh Asina, Prime Minister of Bangladesh, and Her Excellency Mia Motli, Prime Minister of Barbados, I would like to add my voice to that of Dr. Tedros Kibrisius and Mr. Chudon Hyu to open the high-level interactive dialogue on IMR sessions and to confirm that the OIE, the World Organization for Animal Health, is more than ever committed to working with them to tackle antimicrobial resistance. We are involved in two ways. As veterinarians, we are of course concerned with public health issues and strongly engage on a daily basis in the One Health approach. But I must also point out that the animal sector has its own unique interest in keeping antimicrobials working. Effective antimicrobials in animals must also be available for the many different animal species and diseases so that animal health and welfare can be preserved. For these reasons, the OIE has for many years been developing programs aimed at helping its members to design and implement collaborative national action plans for IMR. In doing so, we also advocate for an equitable and balanced leadership and resource distribution to ensure the efficient and sustainable implementation of these national action plans. It's important to bear in mind that we are dealing with sectors that have historically received fewer resources, even though they are often in the critical spotlight. However, despite the many constraints, 
substantial development have taken, be play, have taken place in the past five years in the animal sector to map usage patterns of antimicrobial agents, to promote sector capacity building and the prudent use of antimicrobials. And last but not least, we have significantly raised stakeholder awareness thanks to a series of dynamic communication campaign. Thank you to all colleagues and stakeholders who made it possible. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, whatever the international organization do, we know that nothing is possible without country ownership. One of the conditions of such ownership is pragmatism. To be well driven by countries, the proposed action plans must be realistic and take into account inputs from the farmers and other animal health professionals who are at the front line when it's come to implementing the rules. Today, thanks to recommendations of the UNIHG established in 2016, the tripartite partners are not longer alone. We are supported by the Global Leaders Group and will soon be supported by two other groups. Antimicrobial resistance is an urgent global concern. The engagement of the Global Leaders Group is a definite help in elevating the issues and ensuring sustainable political momentum. Thanks to the great commitment of its members and under the leadership of the two co-chairs, our voice is stronger in advocating for investment in a one health multi-sector approach and in calling for international solidarity to tackle IMR. The COVID-19 pandemic has increased awareness of the importance of research for the development of new vaccines and of step stepping up industrial production capacities. For IMR2, disease prevention through vaccination is an important approach to prevent diseases and reduce the overuse and misuse of antimicrobials. This requires intervention at all levels and the lessons learned from the global response to COVID-19 may be useful in this respect. To conclude, I would like to remind you that we all have a role to play in protecting the efficacy of antimicrobials. There must be a long-term commitment by all stakeholders to a collaborative one else approach supported by practical steps that can be implemented in a sustainable way at local level. I thank the UN General Assembly for hosting this high-level interactive dialogue, for stimulating discussion and strengthening political commitment to address the IMR issues. Thank you for your attention. I thank the Director General of the World Organization for Animal Health for her statement. I now give the floor to Ms. Joyce Musia, Deputy Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program, who has joined us through a live video link. Mr. President, Excellencies, and distinguished guests, COVID-19 has been a disaster on many levels, not least the human cost. And it is a disaster about which we were warned many times by many different people when they told us a global pandemic was likely. Yet, we continued to exploit and destroy nature in ways that increased our risks and in many cases failed to prepare for the inevitable. This is a lesson we must learn when it comes to AMR, an issue that is becoming increasingly perversive and dangerous to human, animal, and environmental health. Already, 700,000 people die each year of resistant infections, and human pollution is a big factor in these infections. We are talking about the discharge of drugs and chemicals washed away into the environment. Antibiotics, antivirals, antiseptics, and so on. And not just drugs for humans. Nearly 75% of antimicrobial substances used in aquaculture are lost into the surrounding environment. Wastewater treatment is important, but it is not foolproof. For example, the United Kingdom invests heavily in wastewater treatment, but an estimated 6 million exposure events to antibiotic-resistant E. coli have been occurring each year in coastal recreational waters. There are also links to the climate change and nature and biodiversity loss, which alongside pollution 
make up the triple planetary crisis humanity faces. Some studies have shown that increasing local temperatures are linked to increasing antibiotic resistance in common pathogens. Meanwhile, emerging infections, infectious diseases can be exacerbated by activities such as land clearing and habitat fragmentation, as we saw in COVID-19. This also deprives humanity of potential new medicines. Yes, the warnings of and action on AMR are growing. The Global Leaders Group, the Independent Panel on Evidence for Action Against Antimicrobial Resistance, and Country Action Plans all show this. But we are still far behind the curve. We need to get on top of AMR and get on top of it now. As we do so, we must take a One Health perspective, ensuring that human, environment, and animal health are addressed in a connected manner. We must mobilize the environmental community to increase understanding of the environmental dimensions of AMR, and an upcoming UNEP report is working on doing just that. We must strengthen the capacity for monitoring at the regional and national levels. We must promote agroecological production practices that reduce use of antimicrobials, including those linked to restoration of degraded productive lands. We must run public awareness campaigns that make people realize the dangers of AMR and how to use human and animal medication in a way that does not worsen the problem. As I said, we have lessons to learn from COVID-19. The pandemic also showed that humanity is capable of acting on the science and responding rapidly to emerging issues. This is what we must do now on AMR. I thank you. I thank the <clears throat> Deputy Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program for her statement. <clears throat> We have heard the last speaker for the opening segment of the high-level interactive dialogue. I now invite members to view a short video entitled Antibiotic Resistance, the Silent to Tsunami. <coughs> Following the discovery of penicillin in 1928, antibiotics have saved millions of lives around the world, and the average life expectancy has increased considerably. But the wealth of these miracle drugs is not only a success story. The bacteria have fought back, and today we see an alarming trend. The number of multidrug-resistant bacteria has grown dramatically over the last decades, resulting in thousands of deaths due to infections that cannot be cured. What happened? The massive use of antibiotics has stimulated bacteria to develop resistance mechanisms in order to survive. For many years, we did not know enough to take this global threat seriously. And although awareness and involvement has increased, much damage has already been done. Antibiotics are often prescribed unnecessarily for infections that are likely to go away without treatment. In many countries, antibiotics are also sold over the counter without a prescription from the doctor. At the same time, in many low-income countries, lack of access to antibiotics actually causes more deaths than resistance. Multidrug resistant bacteria spread within hospitals as a result of poor infection control and also between people in the community. Bacteria know no boundaries and extensive international travel and trade help resistance to spread from continent to continent. Antibiotic resistance does not only affect humans but also the health of animals and the environment. It is all connected. The unpleasant truth is that scientists have not come up with a new class of antibiotics since 1987, and we are about to enter a new era where many commonly used antibiotics have lost their effects. Modern medicine relies on the availability of effective antibiotics. Without them, it would be too risky to perform organ transplants, cancer chemotherapy, or even common surgical procedures such as hip replacements. Care of preterm babies would also be at higher risk for untreatable infections. Resistance is costly, both for the individual and for society. 
By 2050, the number of deaths due to antibiotic resistance could reach 10 million per year and thus exceed the number of people who annually die from cancer today. Antibiotic resistance has been considered as dangerous and deadly as terrorism and global warming. Are we heading towards a post-antibiotic era? We cannot reverse this frightening trend, but we can slow it down. And all of us need to change our behavior to once again gain the upper hand in the fight against antibiotic-resistant bacteria. As indicated in the program, this high-level interactive dialogue also consists of four panel discussions and the call to action. Panel discussion one, entitled Antimicrobial Resistance in the Context of COVID-19, will be moderated by Mr. Shervin Bryce Peace, United Nations Bureau Chief of the South African Broadcasting Corporation, and will take place immediately following this opening segment until 11.45 a.m. Panel discussion two, entitled Overview of Global Progress on AMR and Vision of the Global Leaders Group, will also be moderated by Mr. Bryce Peace and will take place immediately following the first panel discussion until 1 p.m. The afternoon meeting will begin with panel discussion three and four, followed by the call to action. Panel discussion three, entitled Tackling AMR at Country Level, will be moderated by Ms. Elizabeth Cousin, President of the Chief Executive Officer of the United Nations Foundation and will take place from 3 to 4.15 p.m. Panel discussion four, entitled Ensuring Sufficient and Sustainable AMR Financing will be also moderated by Ms. Cousins and will take place from 4.15 to 5.30 p.m. The call to action will follow immediately thereafter. Participants are encouraged to use the opportunity during the panel discussions to pose questions and respond in an interactive manner to the comments and presentations made by panelists and other experts. The opening segment is now concluded. We will now begin the panel discussion one entitled Antimicrobial Resistance in the Context of COVID-19. The panel discussion will be moderated by Mr. Sherwin Bryce Peace, United Nations Bureau Chief of the South African Broadcasting Corporation. I warmly welcome Mr. Sherwin Price Peace to this meeting along with the distinguished panelists who will all be joining as us remotely. I now hand over the meeting to Mr. Price Peace and I thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, and to all the speakers in our opening session that really laid a solid foundation for what we seek to do here today. My engagement with the speakers on this first panel is to look at the question of antimicrobial resistance in the context of COVID-19. We've established that the indirect impact of antimicrobial resistance extends beyond increased health risks with wide implications on development and our ability to achieve the SDGs. If the COVID-19 pandemic is a marker in the road, then it points us in a direction and informs us about the degree to which antimicrobial resistance is and will be a drain on the global economy with losses due to reduced productivity caused by sickness of both human beings and animals and the higher costs associated with treatment. So when the UN talks about building back better, what does it mean in the AMR context? How do we ensure a sustainable and inclusive recovery from COVID that infuses resilience into the equation and better fortifies us against what we know is coming? Remember, we have a blueprint. It's called the SDGs, and it requires the full weight of the international community, both public and private, to get the job done. We want to make this panel as interactive as possible for both member states and our external stakeholders. So for those in the General Assembly Hall, if you intend to ask a question a bit later, please indicate by pressing your button so that we can factor you into the conversation earlier rather than later. There's always a mad dash at the end, so let us know early if you'd like the floor. The first panel has two video messages in addition to four speakers who will join us live virtually. They will be given about three minutes each to make introductory remarks following which we'll engage them in a roundtable-type scenario with questions from the floor and elsewhere. 
The following guidance in my briefing notes made me smile, and I thought it might be a humorous way to get us started today. Quote, remarks should be kept jargon-free, using practical examples from own experience and avoiding unnecessary technicalities or lengthy descriptions of issues and or policies. Rather, panelists should identify the key challenges, lessons learned, and their policy implications. And given the complex nature of the subject matter, let's not make it more complicated than it needs to be. First up, we have a pre-recorded message from Ms. Henrietta Ford. Executive Director of UNICEF. We asked her how we needed to seize critical opportunities related to the COVID-19 response to strengthen infection prevention and control to recover better. This was her response. UNICEF recognizes that antimicrobial resistance represents one of the greatest threats to child survival and global health of our time. COVID-19 was a stark reminder of how quickly an infectious disease can spread across countries and around the world, especially when effective treatments are not readily available. But even before the pandemic, we were faced with growing antibiotic resistance, which makes future pandemics alarmingly possible. It will happen again, so we need to be ready we need to dramatically strengthen pandemic preparedness. And we need to do so together across sectors and as a global community. This means building political will towards a One Health approach, underpinned by policies and budgets that put preparedness first. Discussions like this one represent an important step in the right direction. We need the public and private sectors alike, as well as academia, research institutes, NGOs, and UN agencies to join forces and apply what we have learned from the global response to COVID-19 to our fight against antimicrobial resistance. For example, we need to strengthen key elements of health systems including diagnostics and surveillance, and of course, the rapid development and deployment of treatments. Throughout, we need to continue building the political will required to invest in solutions and approaches that can save people's lives in the face of future pandemics. COVID-19 has taught us many lessons. UNICEF urges that we learn now from these lessons and apply what we have learned to our fight against antimicrobial resistance. The time is now. Thank you. We thank the Executive Director of UNICEF for her intervention. Here now, a face and voice the world has come to know very well over the last 12 months or so. Dr. Seth Berkeley, CEO of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. We asked Dr. Berkeley what lessons from the COVID-19 experience could be applied to improve global coordination for health security, to build back better and mitigate future pandemics. His response next. President of the General Assembly, Excellencies, colleagues and friends, thank you for inviting me to this important dialogue to discuss AMR in the context of COVID-19. There are plenty of reasons why we need to bring this pandemic to a swift end. But an important and less talked about reason is the longer this crisis continues, the weaker we will be when it comes to fighting the next one. Because with each day, this crisis is helping to fuel another silent pandemic, that of antimicrobial resistance. Since the beginning of the pandemic, there's been growing concerns about the potential increase in use of antibiotics in some parts of the world to treat COVID-19 patients. By contrast, in many low- and middle-income countries where many antibiotics are not available, countless COVID-19 patients will have developed secondary bacterial infections that have gone untreated. This combination of inappropriate use of antibiotics for a viral infection like COVID-19 and not having access to them when they are needed both threaten to increase the spread of AMR. 
One of the most powerful, far-reaching, and cost-effective ways of preventing this is through expand, expanded access of immunization. The power of immunization against AMR comes twofold. First, from the fact that vaccines protect people from infection in the first place. Fewer infections means fewer use of antibiotics. Second, by reducing the spread of infections, vaccination reduces the opportunity for resistance to develop and spread. The evidence is clear that immunization already significantly curtails the use and misuse of antibiotic drugs by preventing infections, but there's a huge potential to do more. However, this means ensuring that more people, particularly vulnerable at-risk populations, have access to life-saving vaccines. For more than 20 years, Gavi has worked to vaccinate more than 800 million children, protecting half the world's children every year. We support vaccines against 17 infectious diseases, some of which are particularly powerful in preventing AMR, such as pneumococcal, typhoid, and haemophilus influenza type B, and now through COVAX, also COVID-19 vaccines. Our aim over the next five years is to reach children who have not received even a single dose of a routine childhood vaccine, the so-called zero-dose children. Every time we reach a zero-dose child, not only do they, their parents, and their community also get access to better primary health care, but our global early warning system for outbreaks gets a little better. At the same time, through COVAX, we've built the foundations of an architecture to help end this current crisis and build resilience against future pandemics, including the AMR1 that is looming. The speed at which the world has rallied to develop these vaccines and to begin to make them equitably available provides a good model for how we collectively tackle AMR. With additional surge capacity and contingency finance, the Alliance can be ready to provide vaccines for the next outbreak. We will continue to drive efforts towards leaving no one behind with immunization, and we look forward to working with you in the fight against AMR. Because, as with COVID-19, when it comes to AMR, no one is safe until we are all safe. Thank you to Dr. Hurrah, Director of the Wellcome Trust, a charitable fund, uh, foundation focused on health research based in London. So, Jeremy, we'll have some questions for you later. Will allow you now to make some introductory remarks. Over to you. During the dialogue is a really critical step in the United Nations leadership on this issue, and congratulate everybody on the call to action document, which. Welcome is very delighted to endorse. Um, reflecting on lessons from COVID uh, is, of course, a challenge. Uh, but we must reflect on the impact that infectious disease have, not just on health, which is obviously front and centre of our minds, but also on economies uh, and on geopolitics. The importance of preparedness and robust health systems, uh, the importance of collaborations across sectors to identify effective interventions and the importance then of ensuring that those discoveries are shared equitably around the world, an issue that continues, I'm afraid, to be a challenge in COVID-19. Also, the risk of individual national approaches for things that are of global significance. And as we heard in the video, the ability of pathogens to cross borders uh, will remain with us forever. The pandemic has also given a cruel reminder of how devastating uncontrolled infections can be, impacting on lives and on economies. But we can take some positive lessons for EMR from the global response, the power of scientific innovation to create solutions for all of societies. Uh, but it has also exposed pitfalls, such as the need for global solidarity and equitable access to the benefits of that scientific endeavor. It also highlights the risk of inaction of complacency, of not heeding repeated warnings, report warnings that we've had on emerging infections for 20 odd years and for drug resistant infections also for many, many years. If we do not heed these warnings, these warnings will come to reality 
as AMR is today. Also, I think the danger of hiding behind complexity. We mustn't be intimidated into inaction by thinking things are too complex to solve. They can be solved if we put our collective minds to it. AMR, of course, is not new to the global agenda. Indeed, it was discussed in this forum at the United Nations General Assembly in 2016. And we've had lots of reports and warnings about AMR over the intervening years. But the global mobilization to tackle it has not matched the scale of the threat or indeed of the warm words that are spoken about. We've not seen the investment, the innovation, or indeed the political prioritization that is really required. And the time to act is now. So the asks of nice nations leaders, member states, non-government organizations, when looking at what change and what implementations we need to consider to implement now, let us act now rather than continue to talk. As we think through COVID and come out of the COVID pandemic in 22 and beyond, as we think about strengthening global health capacities for epidemics, let us ensure that we build in, for instance, in surveillance, all of the infectious disease threats. Let's not just focus narrowly on emerging viral pathogens. Let's make sure that we put AMR at the center of that surveillance as well. That is the only way to make a sustainable global surveillance system that can heed warnings of emerging pathogens and can deal with endemic diseases uh, and the drug resistance at the same time. Drug resistant infections uh, are not black swan events or an unquantifiable risk. We know what we're facing. 40 to 60% of infections in many countries are now resistant to pathogens. And this undermines the whole of modern medicine. High income countries must do more to provide financial and technical assistance. And all countries must invest in R&D and surveillance but also in the controlled use of antibiotics, equitably accessible in the human and animal sector, but responsible use is critical if we're going to protect these critical class of drugs for what we need them to allow us to do modern medicine in the way we all want to do. It is within our hands to solve these problems. We must not hide behind complexity or thinking this is too difficult. And if it is not us that take on this and act, then who is it that will do so? It is us. Thank you very much. An excellent intervention. We thank you, uh, Sir Jeremy Farrar. Uh, you talk about the time is now to act. Uh, the, the risk of inaction and complacency, the time is now. Dr. Mufrin Mpundu is the director of REACT Africa, one of the first international independent networks that seek to articulate the complex nature of antibiotic resistance and its drivers. Dr. Mpundu, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Your Excellencies. Uh, working with several African countries on AMR, the greatest challenge I have observed is the implementation of the One Health National Action Plans, moving from paper to action. Uh, challenges include half-hearted political will, multi-sectoral collaboration, not and an uh, not un underfunded NAPs, that those are national action plans. Uh, the current weak health systems are unable to respond to pandemics such as COVID and AMR. And furthermore, the lack of the system's view and fragmentation causes countries to seek small funding from different sources that could complicate coordinated planning and implementation. Although several AMR activities are ongoing in many countries, most are time-bound projects which are not integrated into national budgets or policies or systems. It is high time to respond to the ICG recommendations of systematic and meaningful engagement of civil society groups and organizations as key stakeholders in the One Health Response to AMR at global, regional, national, and local, uh, local levels. Uh, CSOs, are way, um, as well as professional organizations, have a lot to offer if included as partners in countries' work to implement the NAPs and in building uh, resilient systems. Uh, CSOs like React Africa have been supporting national government in NAP development and implementation of various AMR strategic goals, uh, including awareness raising, health education, to reduce unnecessary uh, demand of uh, antibiotics and working uh, collaboration uh, with the tripartite and Africa CDC on AMR agendas. Unfortunately, CSO engagement is minimal at national and regional level. I see COVID, 
and AMR uh, giving us a time to rethink our approach, mobilize a true national and global response that brings everybody together. Each day that passes is a missed opportunity. It's time to act now. We cannot wait. Thank you. Thank you to Dr. Mpundu. Uh, I really admired the uh, African artifact, uh, artifact over your right shoulder. As you can see over my left shoulder, I have a zebra. So I see you. Uh, also, uh, talking about the hi highlighting the need for implementation of national action plans and their importance. Our next panelist is Dr. Ramanan Laksmanarayan, Director of the Center for Disease Dynamics, Economics and Policy, an organization that produces independent, multidisciplinary research to advance the health and well-being of human populations around the world and headquartered in Washington. Dr. Laksman Ryan, over to you. Uh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, President of the General Assembly, Excellencies, uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, I'm in New Delhi right now, and I have to tell you, I am experiencing firsthand uh, being in the middle of what I can only describe as a COVID war zone. Um, and, uh, you know, in the time that I would have spoken with you, I would have had five text messages for people looking for oxygen or for beds, none of which is available. And I think we're seeing what happens when A, our warnings are ignored, and B, when we've just not done anything to prepare the world for what is about to come. Because one of the things about infectious diseases is that at normal times, people always think this is something that happens to someone else somewhere else. It happens in Africa, it happens in Asia, it doesn't happen here. And I think if one thing COVID has taught us very strongly is that we're all connected. It can happen there yesterday, but it'll be here today and somewhere else tomorrow. And, uh, you know, if we've not learned that lesson after COVID, I don't know what will. Uh, I've never been in a, in a situation like this of, this, of this amount of grief and, and frankly, of just despair as is happening right now. Now, AMR is a, is a cause that I've committed most of my professional life to. And the thing to remember is that antibiotics are the most prescribed medicines in the world. And the thing about antibiotics is also that, although we're concerned about drug resistance, we have to remember that lack of access to antibiotics still kills more people around the world than drug resistance does. However, if we fail to stop the problem of growing drug resistance, resistance itself is becoming a barrier to access because people are not able to afford the more expensive antibiotics that are needed of them. So we have to figure out ways which are scalable of using antibiotics appropriately, and we have to also make sure that they are accessible and not place barriers to people being able to access these medications. We have to solve also the issue of developing new antibiotics. We were fortunate to have new vaccines, as many as we did for COVID. We've not had as much luck for new antibiotics. Uh, many organizations, including Guard B, which is set up by the Global Antibiotic Resistance, uh, Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, which is uh, set up by the World Health Organization, have been working along with many partners to figure out how to bring drugs to market at a low cost. Because if we don't solve the problem of bringing drugs to market at low cost, the industry will work, but only for people who can afford antibiotics that are very expensive. The world cannot afford $10,000 antibiotics. That work for some people, but not for most people. Developing new antibiotics is an urgent need. I would urge the UN to not ignore this aspect of things and to find out how we can you know, find ways of, of, of improving that supply of new antibiotics. Um, I think the, the, the third thing is that, you know, when it comes down to COVID again, uh, what I hear often is that people say, we just didn't know. We just didn't know this could happen. Nobody warned us. Now, it's a question of who is responsible for that warning. Obviously, the team of scientists, people who work in the public health community, try to do this all the time. But if we have failed to communicate this to people, it is also our failure as much as it is the world's failure. And we certainly cannot make that mistake with drug resistance again. I think we have to explain this problem in a way that is accessible to people, that people understand that the consequences of using antibiotics inappropriately. COVID, as many of my co-panelists have said, has become an excuse to use antibiotics inappropriately and is itself driving up resistance just because there's no other treatment that's available and in many places, especially in places where, you know, the steroids and the remdesivir, all these other treatments are not really available. So the antibiotics have to, you know, they come into play here, but completely inappropriately. And so what I'll end by saying is that 
this responsibility is really on our shoulders and and really we have to expand this community that worries about AMR. In fact, my own organization has realized that we have to think about this in a One Health way. In fact, our board voted to call ourselves the One Health Trust. And I would urge that we not just only think of AMR, which is very dear to my heart, that the world approach One Health as really being its framing agenda rather than just AMR, and that it actively go towards that framing as the way in which we prevent future pandemics, including on antimicrobial resistance. Thank you for having me. We thank you for your intervention, Dr. Luxman Narayan, and I'll just uh, re uh, repeat what you've said. One thing COVID has taught us is we're all connected. It's here today, but can be there tomorrow. Uh, our thoughts are certainly with the people of India at this time. It really is providing us a real, a real time lesson, uh, for use of a better word, highlighting also the need for public awareness campaigns. Our final panelist is the executive director of the South Center, an intergovernmental organization of developing countries that seeks to combine their collective efforts to promote their common interests in the international area. Uh, case in point, antimicrobial resistance. Dr. Carlos Correa, your introductory remarks, please. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting the South Center to participate in this important meeting. President of the Assembly, Excellencies, the South Center, as an intergovernmental organization, works mainly with governments, with the members of developing countries. But in this particular area, we work with civil society organizations because we think that civil society organizations have a major role in promoting the fight against the AMR. So, during these days, the fight against COVID-19 has uh, taken such an importance, this is certainly a urgent matter. People suffer from the world because of this disease. But this should not reduce the efforts in order to address AMR. AMR has been called a silent pandemic. So it's very time that this meeting has been organized. Efforts should continue to ensure that this pandemic is under. So my second comment is about the lens under which uh, AMR often as. This is generally the lens of public health. Of course, AMR is a major global health security issue, but it's also a development issue. As one may AMR creates costs in terms of treatment, it creates costs in terms of death, ability. So there is for addressing AMR in the systemic plan for developing countries is a major it will also be a challenge when production system for food, for instance, need to be changed, because this will also imply that some costs need to be absorbed by the kind of producers, for instance, when methodologies methods to produce um, animals or things uh, are looked at. So the third, the third moment is about the importance of the UN agencies working in this area, the guidance Guided by UN, the government system has been established has been very important. It has guided many countries to establish, as was mentioned, national plans. There is still the need to accelerate the implementation of these plans. But in any case, uh, this governance has been important and it continues to be important. Unfortunately, there was nothing similar like this in order to address the COVID 19 crisis. The fourth comment is about again, the role of uh, civil society organization and uh, social cooperation. In many, in many developing, developing countries, there are very interesting experiences in the way in which AMR is addressed. And this should provide a model for other countries. Then we will certainly wish to encourage that uh, more cooperation takes place between developing countries themselves. And then finally, I have been comments about solidarity. And if something has be, uh, failed in the context of COVID-19 is an effective solidarity that has been proclaimed in many regulations and uh, and in many resolutions by the World Health Organization. However, the equal distribution of vaccines clearly shows that we have not had such a solidarity in practice. So let's hope that when we deal with uh, this silent pandemic, the pandemic of AMR, real solidarity is put in place the nation mechanisms actually work, and it's possible for all to get the benefits of treatment and needed access 
In some cases, they are very simple in providing water, sanitation, investment needed, but solidarity needs to be realistic, needs to be made, and just the Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Carlos Correa, for your intervention. So I will just say your audio was very, very difficult for us to hear. So maybe the UN technicians can engage with you and li- liaise with you because I'm going to do a round of questions now with our panelists and hopefully we can sort out the sound issues. You're breaking up a lot. It was very, very difficult to follow what you were saying. So Jeremy Farrar, can I start with you? Antimicrobial resistance is often viewed as a complex niche issue, something you addressed in your opening remarks. What actions are needed to better engage the public? And how can we mobilize politicians to engage and invest in an issue where success may be hard to illustrate uh, in terms of long-term returns in the absence of a crisis now? Your audio, Sir Jeremy, we can't hear you. Uh, It's a great question because, again, as as COVID has, has shown us, Um, science can contribute a huge amount, politics can contribute a huge amount, but ultimately we all have to own this. Uh, It isn't just the preserve of scientists or politicians, it's all of us who are also part of communities and uh, and the public. And I think we've not done a good job in explaining a complex area, uh, but also explaining that there are solutions. Um, And that it's in our power to make that progress. Often when you have these complex issues, and let's face it, many of the challenges of the 21st century are going to be complex. They're going to be global, they're transnational, they're going to require multi-sector cooperation, as our colleagues on the panel have said. But that doesn't mean to say we mustn't be intimidated by that, uh, because there are solutions, some of which are known now and more which science will give us. I think we've got to take the jargon out of these phrases and words, and we've got to keep it to a level that we can all understand. And the bottom line is, the whole of modern medicine depends on this, from cancer therapy to maternal child health to every aspect of modern medicine that we've come to rely on depends on being able to control, prevent, and treat infections. And I think we need to bring it home to all of us, all our friends, family, relatives, communities, about how the importance of this amazing class of drugs and indeed vaccines is. Let me quickly follow up with you. Doesn't the current crisis, the current pandemic, uh, inform what needs to be done in the future. Isn't this a good uh, uh, juncture at which to, to really talk about this? It, it really does. And, and, and nobody wants to have the crisis going through. And Ramanan, all thoughts with you and family and colleagues in India at the moment of what you're going through, and indeed in many other countries, Brazil and elsewhere. Uh, we mustn't use this crisis and abuse it. But nevertheless, yes, the power of infectious diseases Uh, The heeding of warnings, again, I repeat, uh, drug resistance has been with us and we've known about it since actually the first drug penicillin was ever invented. Fleming talked about drug resistance in his Nobel Prize speech. This isn't new, but I don't think we've got the message across. And maybe the awful case of COVID-19 in the last 15 months just demonstrates the continued power of infectious diseases to take lives, disrupt societies and destroy economies and education. And we have to uh, put this drug-resistant, slower pandemic in the same context. I agree. Thank you, Sir Jeremy. Dr. Murphan and Pundu, let's get you to jump in now. What role can non-governmental stakeholders play to support, complement and or enhance national efforts to address AMR and implement uh, NAPs, the national action plans? You touched on this in your opening remarks. Maybe delve a little deeper. Your audio. Yeah, firstly, I would like to I would like to say by uh, demystifying the the myth that I mean, civil society organizations are, are rubber rousers and they are there to create uh, uh, problems with government. But actually, uh, they are there to partner with government and to work alongside. Uh, civil societies um, are looking at uh, national action plans. Uh, they can actually support in many ways. In implementation, for instance, of the national strategies, uh, they can contribute in the development of those uh, 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 strategies. They can work in communities um, and uh, uh, basically support the community-based intervention uh, uh, in raising awareness, in being able to provide, actually, uh, 
uh, the hospital care, in prevention, and also in treatment. Uh, they can be an advocacy uh, agent uh, uh, that actually um, brings up this issue, engages the media. Um, uh, we have trained a lot of uh, uh, media organizations about AMA and so that they can be able to actually uh, get an interest and take the message out. Uh, they can increase the visibility and promote also stewardship. Uh, another area is in the area of research. I mean, addressing the current gaps and uh, uh, being able to, um, uh, to provide some new actually innovation and contributing to uh, uh, global discussions. Uh, we just released uh, a really a paper as React on an end-to-end -end approach, and that is intended to uh, to work along alongside and uh, contribute alternatives to the issue of access to uh, um, to antibiotic. As Raman said earlier on, is that you know uh, lack of access actually kills more people than antimicrobial resistance itself. Uh, the other areas, I mean, through the antibiotic resistance coalition, uh, 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 that's a group of uh, uh, members that focus. Uh, uh, on antimicrobial resistance I mean, across the sectors and the React South Center uh, and uh, uh, the annual conferences, uh, uh, they serve as platforms for the member organizations to discuss the key, the key issues in policy uh, uh, related to EMA and share organization expertise across the sectors and countries. And uh, they mount collective responses across the policy forums, uh, uh, notably intergovernmental um, intergovernmental organizations. And the other thing that we have done is that uh, we realized, for example, in Africa that there were very few CSOs uh, uh, that were actually engaged uh, um, in AMR from the environment, uh, the animal sector, and the human sector. And what we did was to try and uh, uh, create a platform uh, uh, in Africa, working with the Africa CDC, and uh, uh, we have actually an annual conference every year, and we have a platform of exchange of ideas and uh, are really, uh, we've trained a lot of uh, uh, the AMA focal persons in countries that are running the problem, I mean, uh, the programs in most countries. And so uh, we have many ways to contribute. I mean, taking right. expertise uh, in advocacy and other areas. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mpundu. Uh, obviously, the importance uh, there that you highlight of civil society uh, being rabble rousers, I'm sure they'll take that as a badge of honor. Uh, talking very much of a bottom-up approach, not just the high-level uh, scenario that we're engaging in right now. Uh, Dr. Luxman Arayan, uh, effective action against AMR relies on comprehensive data collection and surveillance capacity. What work has been done to increase and coordinate, uh, coordinate global surveillance, particularly in low-resource settings? And what are the gaps that remain? Over to you. So if a problem is not measured, it is invisible. And that has been the problem with AMR for many years. People think that this is a crisis in the future. It is not. It is a crisis right now. And AMR, by some estimates, kills 700,000 people a year, which is a tremendously large number, and many of these in developing countries. Now, the reason we're able to get even some estimates is because our ability to measure has improved vastly in the last decade uh, because of investments made by many. But uh, I would really like to highlight, you know, the work done by the Fleming Fund of the UK in helping bring to light, you know, some of the, uh, the, the data that exists in developing countries and also help put in place surveillance systems and also work by the World Health Organization in this regard. And also by private, you know, other platforms. So uh, CDEP, my own organization, has run resistancemap.org for many years now primarily for this reason, which is that if we don't have data, we don't really, uh, we have no, we, know, we don't have any visibility on the problem. But what we have is not sufficient. We don't yet know with perfect clarity, or at least reasonable clarity, how many infections are caused by AMR. When we don't have that information, we lose policymakers. We also lose, I mean, we lose their attention. We also lose the attention of pharma companies in, in convincing them that this is an important market for them to tap into. We also lose the attention of civil society and the media. I mean, I don't mean the organizations that are represented here, but, but many others who don't see that this is a problem that kills many children. Our own estimates, when we published these a few years ago, was that uh, uh, neonatal sepsis drug resistance, a drug resistance in first-line antibiotics used to treat neonatal sepsis, killed 250,000 newborns every year. And that was a big surprise to many people. It, was, it took a few years to come to that analysis. But people now realize that we can't improve 
on neonatal mortality and on child health unless we've tackled AMR. When we were able to estimate the impact of AMR on, on uh, mortality associated with, with cancers and, and surgeries that couldn't be performed as effectively without having effective prophylaxis, that brought some attention to the idea that, that Jeremy just pointed out, which is that AMR is, or antibiotics are the bedrock of modern medicine. People know that, but the numbers are very important. I think this is an important uh, investment for the global community to make. Uh, there have been proposals to put together something which resembles the IPCC for climate for the case of AMR. There's an architecture in place. This, was, uh, this has been the recommendation of many high-level committees. And I would urge all of the member countries to put that architecture in place at the earliest so that we have more eyes on the problem. Thank you. We can't hear you. Apologies, I'm back. Action on AMR is necessary, Dr. Korea, uh, at all levels of governance, international, national, subnational, and local. What are some examples of effective governance coordination and action that can be shared for accelerating progress against AMRs? Well, okay. You can hear me now? Better? Sounds a little better, for sure. Okay, all right. Well, uh, so what is a good example of uh, action against AMR? Uh, so what, what we need in the first place is the government structure that coordinates action across sectors. Uh, you need uh, that work is done not only at the national level, but also at the provincial level. This must be based, of course, on the one approach. Civil society participation is, is crucial, and um, certainly the society behavior will be crucial in order to address the challenges of uh, the uh, as it is the case now for COVID-19. So civil society is crucial in uh, leading all at the level in order to ensure that it's taken. So I don't know if you can hear me. So there is one example in Africa, for instance, the case of Zimbabwe. The Zimbabwe has adopted a national plan, this is the one approach following global action plan. He has created a national champions group. He has a core group of all the ministries who participate in the plan. They have been supported by the World Health Organization, by FAO, by OIE, also by the Fund. In fact, they have been considered a pilot country. So I think this is a good example of how these policies implemented. Maybe as I mentioned before, this could be a good uh, basis for uh, cooperation. And uh, the, uh, in the case of Zimbabwe and other countries, investment cooperation is good for more investment necessary in order to this uh, pandemic. Dr. Korea, thank you so much. Uh, you started well, but then it started to fade again. So we're still having some okay. of the difficulties with, with, your, with your laptop there. I'm going to open it now to questions from the General Assembly floor. Uh, since there is no established list of speakers, participants are encouraged to engage interactively and avoid reading from written statements. Delegates, uh, uh, Delegations wishing to speak are requested to press the microphone <laughs> button. I thank you for your cooperation. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of the European Union. Over to you. Thank you, Sherry, and um, <clears throat> my sincere thanks to all the, all the briefers and panelists. Um, this is an extremely fascinating debate, and it is for us uh, in particular because AMR has always been, has been high on the EU agenda for quite some time. Already in 2017, we adopted a EU One Health Action Plan against AMR, and we continue to see AMR and combating AMR through a One Health approach as a priority. But the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has also taught us some lessons. And one of them is that we need to broaden the One Health approaches to better reflect the environmental dimension because we've seen the effects of uh, environmental degradation, biodiversity and habitat loss on human health and how they foster the occurrences of zoonotic diseases. And we should therefore look more closely at the environmental aspects of One Health in the context of AMR such as the effects of the release of antimicrobials in the environment and on wildlife. So my question to the panelists 
is how far is this already incorporated in One Health approaches? And if it's not sufficiently <coughs> incorporated, what are your recommendations to better integrate it? Thanks. I thank the distinguished representative of the European Union. I will now give the floor to the Organization for the Economic Cooperation and Development. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, for convening today's uh, meeting uh, and also to our distinguished panelists for their uh, very rich presentations. Uh, dear colleagues, it's clear that the uh, human and economic cost of antimicrobial resistance in the next three decades uh, will be unacceptably high uh, in the absence of uh, further action. Uh, our own research at the OECD uh, suggests that uh, superbug infections would claim the lives of about two and a half million people uh, in Europe and North America uh, and Australia alone uh, if no action is taken, uh, and that dealing with the consequences of uh, AMR would cost uh, our economies about three and a half billion dollars a year. Uh, and now that's just for the 33 uh, countries that were included uh, in the initial uh, OECD uh, analysis. So our work shows that uh, there are three levers through which we could uh, prevent this uh, high toll. Uh, first of all, we need to put in place actions to promote the prudent use of uh, antimicrobials in every sector, uh, the so-called One Health approach, uh, which was alluded to by uh, several panelists. This means using old technologies such as hygiene in healthcare structures or hand washing, but also up upscaling new technologies, rapid diagnostic tests, new vaccines, alternatives to microbials, and, and so on. At the OECD, we calculated that an intervention package combining stewardship programs, enhanced hospital hygiene, mass media campaigns, use of rapid diagnostic tests would avert about 47,000 deaths. Uh, across those uh, per year, sorry, 47,000 deaths per year across those 33 countries I mentioned earlier. Uh, and this package would pay for itself within a year. Uh, and beyond the first year, we'd be saving about $1.50 for every dollar that we uh, invest in these uh, interventions. Second, we need to introduce uh, better incentives to restart the R&D pipeline, uh, bringing new antimicrobials, uh, vaccines, and diagnostics to the market. Uh, that will mean uh, economic incentives to address uh, market failures, but also to uh, enhance collaboration on R&D. Third and finally, we really need to make sure that high-quality antimicrobials are available wherever they're needed, independently of the level of income uh, of, of a country in which any patient may live. Uh, we know that suboptimal use of antibiotics uh, is a leading cause of AMR, uh, and as COVID-19 has shown, uh, infections know no borders. Uh, and their consequences can be huge in scale uh, and impact. So ins ensuring access at the global level really is an investment uh, in a safer world for all. Thank you very much. I thank the delegate from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and I now give the floor to the delegate from Cuba. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. My delegation, first of all, wishes to thank uh, the President of the General Assembly and his office for having convened this important meeting, as well as the efforts of the UN system in tackling the important question of uh, AMR. I would also like to thank all the panelists in this first panel for their presence and the contribution of the other panelists, which will take the floor later on today. Certainly, distinguished panelists, AMR is a global problem which needs to be tackled globally. In the view of our delegation, the response to this issue, as with many other issues, depends on the capacity of each country and its level of development. Therefore, as is the case in the present international economic order, which is unjust by nature, developing countries are at a disadvantage. And among developing countries, it's even worse for those of us who are subjected to the impact of unilateral coercive measures. In this regard, I have a question for the executive director of the South Center, whom we welcome. 
With regard to the impact, in his view, of unilateral coercive measures on health systems, and in particular on the capacity of countries to effectively tackle AMR. Thank you very much. I thank the distinguished representative of Cuba, and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of the Republic of Korea. Uh, thank you, panelists. I share the concern of fragmentation of our respective efforts or plans. So my question is, do, we, do you think in your assessment we have uh, adequate instruments or international framework in place to avoid such fragmentation? And secondly, in order to turn the COVID-19 crisis into an opportunity to highlight the threat of AML, what concise and clear message or narrative we can make and deliver to the general public to raise awareness of AML in the context of COVID-19 with the aim of ultimately to present and practice something actionable in public and private partnership? Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the Republic of Korea, and I now give the floor and to our final intervention from the GA, uh, the distinguished representative of the Dominican Republic. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I thank the panelists for their very valuable contributions. The Dominican Republic has made important progress in surveilling M AMR, and it has declared an important event uh, for the public health of the Dominican people. We are participating in the resistance plan on antimicrobials. We have protocols in terms of the use of uh, these medicines in various pathologies. The Dominican Republic, the Dominican Republic to date has vaccinated almost one million Dominicans. They have been fully vaccinated. The commitment of the government is not to leave anyone behind as soon as possible and to complete the vaccination process to all Dominicans. However, the cooperation of the international community will be vital for us to achieve this goal. From 2012, the country has a national network of AMR laboratories uh, coordinated by Dr. Fiol and the Argentina Institute as part of the Inter-American network of AMR. We have political will to implement universal coverage with an approach to uh, the patient and uh, as well as progress made toward UHC. We are developing capacities for the staff which participates in patient care and the rational use of antibiotics in animals, human training, and the incorporation of high-level technologies. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the Dominican Republic. We are now going to conclude this panel. So I'm going to, uh, based on some of the questions that were raised by our member states, I'm going to go uh, to our panelists. Maybe we can start with Dr. Carlos Correa and give you each one minute to uh, respond to some of the questions and to make some concluding remarks. Over to you, Dr. Correa. Well, I hope you can hear me now. Yeah? That's great. Well, just uh, let me say that I fully agree with the statement from the Union regarding the need to broaden the concept of one health and fully include environmental dimension. This is crucial, and certainly UNEP's role is, is very important in promoting this, this approach. There was a question from the distinguished delegate from Cuba regarding the impact of unilateral coercive measures in relation to the health systems. Uh, the South Center has produced in the last year's report on the subject, in particular in relation to the blockade that Cuba is suffering almost for 60 years and the devastating effect that this blockade has 
in terms of uh, access to medicine equipment. Uh, so uh, certainly this is a matter that needs to be the international community. And this measure has to be indicated and uh, for the equipment. So uh, that's an important thing. Uh, let me just add that uh, we today the discussion which is starting at the Western organization about the possible pandemic treaty. Uh, this has been proposed by 27 of states. And it would be interesting to see whether AMR might be part of this pandemic treaty. Thank you very much. Can't hear you, huh? Dr. Laxman Ryan, uh, could we get your concluding remarks? My apologies. Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to address the very first question about the One Health uh, and how much it's embedded. But let me start with a bigger picture. This is the United Nations, and, and what you all think about is the big picture, not the questions of tactics, but really where the globe is going. And I'd like to remind you that things have changed in the last 100 years. We've witnessed the greatest increase in demand for animal protein ever seen on the planet. 30% of the global biomass of mammals in the world is us humans. 60% of the global biomass of the planet is the animals that we eat. All of our elephants and zebras, which you have on your side next to you, all of those other animals uh, are only 10% of the biomass. This has significant consequences for AMR. It has consequences for climate change. So I think we need to step back and look at what the large trends are and try to influence those large trends rather than you know, just look at this one AMR issue, which I'm very, again, passionate about, but I think we need to expand our lens to One Health more broadly, recognize that when we try to expand animal production to the scale that we're doing, it has consequences for our health, it has consequences for the health of animals. We recorded that in many studies, that resistance is going up in the animals as well. It has consequences for the oceans, it has consequences for the environment. So I would urge us to sort of back a little bit and say, is this how we want to go forward and is this the way in which we will fumble into the next crisis? Thank you. Prescient words, Dr. Lachman Narayan. Thank you so much for that intervention. Dr. Mirfan Mpundu, uh, your final uh, comment, please. Uh, thank you so much. I will uh, make a couple of comments. I think the first one is uh, that uh, uh, the challenge of One Health uh, uh, approach is that uh, I always say that it's a concept that seems to work at a higher level and does not necessarily work at the regional or at the country level. I think we need to rethink that. And uh, uh, probably uh, uh, the other comment that I would make is that, you know, the, uh, the tripartite uh, uh, plus, uh, uh, the UNEP uh, was a late come. I think we need to call it a quadripartite and have them as uh, uh, really a huge part of that. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, the DG of actually uh, UNEP, I think, made uh, uh, really a lot of actually points in terms of the, um, uh, the role that the environment actually plays. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, we, and I've been talking about this uh, a lot in uh, uh, these forums, is that uh, most low- and middle-income countries, uh, they were helped with funding to develop the national action plans. They are failing to implement the national action plan they don't have the funds we need you know we can't run away from this elephant in the room you know we can talk about strengthening health systems it's not going to happen we need to fund local me uh, i mean i mean local uh, medium income countries by finding a way uh, from the high income countries and uh, uh, these financial institutions otherwise uh, we will not make any gain. If we make gains in the high-income countries and we don't in the low-middle-income uh, countries, we know what will happen. We will be, uh, will be far worse in the next 10 years and we'll come back here and have the same uh, uh, discussions. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. From your lips to everyone's ears, Dr. Mpundu, thank you so much for that. Uh, so, Jeremy, uh, the final word. Yeah, I welcome all the comments from the, the honourable delegates. Uh, to the European Union, absolutely agree. Yeah, it's about integration, but we've got to ask ourselves, why have we fragmented in the first place? Why do we have training courses and train the next generation of people to think in these silos when we need to bring them together, including the economic issues, the incentives that we provide? 
as well as the One Health agenda that you quite rightly uh, talked about. Absolutely endorse what Ramanan said about data. That's data for health. It's data for the environment. It's also the economic data and pay tribute to the OECD and their very important report of the benefits of investing in this space and the damages if we do not do so. Uh, but we have the we have the tools available now. And this threat is not something that's going to come 10 or 20 years time. This is now. It is changing medicine as we speak. And it will be worse as a result, actually, of the pandemic. And so this is not something we can put off till tomorrow. Let's heed the warnings. Let's learn what we did with COVID, where we had the warnings and we chose not to act. If we don't act now, then this will be the tsunami that we've been warning about for many, many years. Over. So Jeremy Farrar, Dr. Murthram Pundu, Dr. Ramanan Laksman Narayan, and Dr. Carlos Correa, we thank you so much for spending this time with us and for infusing us with a lot of inspiration and a lot of work uh, on the road ahead. We thank you for your contributions this morning. I want to close this panel with some key facts from the WHO worth repeating as we conclude. Antibiotic resistance is one of the biggest threats to global health, food security, and development today. Antibiotic resistance can affect anyone of any age in any country. Antibiotic resistance occurs naturally, but misuse of antibiotics in humans and animals is accelerating that process. A growing number of infections such as pneumonia, tuberculosis, gonorrhea, and other diseases are becoming harder to treat as the antibiotics used to treat them become less effective. Antibiotic resistance leads to longer hospital stays, higher medical costs, and increased mortality. We need an integrated, collective approach if we are to build back better. Okay, so as we transition to the next panel, perhaps stretch your legs, shake out your hands, roll your shoulders, do what you need to do to keep the blood flowing, but watch this next video and see how Colombia is creating a surveillance program that seeks to help farmers, retailers, and restauranteurs limit the rise and spread of superbugs that develop in animals. Take a look. And we found a decrease in uh, antimicrobial resistance for Salmonella and for E. coli. The demand for antibiotic-free chicken is growing day by day. Everyone is more conscious of responsible consumption. This program increased the awareness of antimicrobial resistance issues in Colombia. And you could say, that it was at the base for a new policy of regulation. De manera precisa, quiero señalar el caso de la colistina. Entonces se ha expedido una resolución de la prohibición del uso de esta sustancia como eh, promotor de crecimiento, con un propósito, proteger la sanidad animal, proteger la salud pública y la inocuidad de los alimentos.
Welcome back. And if you've just joined us, you missed a great first panel, but you're just in time for what should be a great second, equally interesting and interactive discussion. Our objectives in the second panel is to identify key actions and progress made at the global level following the 2016 high-level meeting on tackling antimicrobial resistance. We want to look at the need for global governance systems, sustainable investments, establishment of efficient mandates, and strengthened institutions to deliver an effective multi-sectoral response to AMR, while presenting the vision and objectives of the newly established One Health Global Leaders Group on AMR. And if that sounded like a mouthful, I think it does justice to the complexity of the task that lies ahead of us all. As we did in the first panel, I'm going to introduce our speakers. They will each make brief remarks for about three minutes each, and then I'll post around, pose a round of questions before we open it up to the floor. A reminder to member states that if you would like to make an intervention when we open this up in a bit, please press your button early so that we can factor you into the discussion. We have five panelists in the session. I will ask them to mute their mics until I call on them, and I will introduce each and give them three minutes for introductory remarks. Dr. Hanan Balki is an Assistant Director General for Antimicrobial Resistance at the World Health Organization. Everybody, please mute your mics which forms part of the Joint Tripartite Secretariat with the Food and Agriculture Organization, or OIE, or, and OIE, excuse me, the World Organization for Animal Health that coordinates the global response to AMR. Dr. Balke, good to see you again. Over to you. Thank you very much, Sherwin. Um, President of the Assembly, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, and colleagues from around the world, good afternoon to all of you from Geneva. In fact, antimicrobial resistance is a personal topic for me. As someone who specialized in pediatric infectious diseases and was challenged on a regular basis for the past 20 years or more while caring for children for over 20 years by the lack of effective antimicrobial agents to treat my patients, AMR is personal. AMR is also personal for the many people around the world for which their lives were jeopardized or cut short because of the lack of an effective antimicrobial agent to treat their infections in a timely fashion. Because of this, I am and we are grateful to His Excellency, the President of the General Assembly, for convening this high-level dialogue as there is no time to waste in addressing the urgent global threat of AMR. This dialogue is an important step in uh, regaining strong political visibility and mobilization that we need to mitigate the continued emergence of resistance among a vast number of pathogens, not a single one. So it is an honor to represent today the Tripartite Joint Secretariat on Antimicrobial Resistance as we continue our collaboration across sectors to ensure that AMR is addressed with a One Health approach. The Tripartite have taken important steps over the past two years, most notably the internal strengthening of capacity to address AMR within each of these organizations, but as well as collectively the organizations among, uh, establish, among them is establishing our tripartite joint secretariat, the multi-partner trust fund, and the global leaders group, whom I am joined by several of them during these different panels. I look forward to the discussion on the global progress and the work ahead of us, of all of us during this uh, panel. Uh, Sherwin, back to you. Thanks, Dr. Balki, and thank you for starting us off. Next up, allow me to introduce Professor Dame Sally Davies, who is the UK's Special Envoy on Antimicrobial Resistance and formerly Chief Medical Officer for England. She's also the Sherpa for the Global Leaders Group. Professor Davies, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the President of the General Assembly for hosting this really important and timely meeting. And actually, all of you for watching and caring Good afternoon from Cambridge in England. So I've been advocating for tangible and ambitious action on AMR for almost a decade now. It matters to humans, to animals, and the food chain. And also, we've now discovered the sustainability of the entire planet. Justice, equality, and security depend on us getting this right. I started out as the Chief Medical Officer for England, campaigning for recognition of AMR, driving for action, including here with the political declaration in 2016 that our facilitator mentioned. With each step, we created more work to do and deliver, but we also understood how antimicrobials and antibiotics 
are really part of the infrastructure of a modern world for health, for food, and the planet. I was honored to co-convene the UN Interagency Coordination Group on AMR, called the IACG. And I've been using this permit, position to generate momentum and advocate for collaboration across every country and sector to act on AMR. Our recommendations from the IACG were in five big areas. We're demanding unprecedented effort from governments, researchers, civil society, and the private sector. We looked to national action plans to give us a path forward and accelerate action in countries, including access to and responsible and sustainable use of antimicrobials. We called for innovative action and research, like Vietnam's commitment to phase out antibiotics in agricultural production, and India's consultation on world first piece of legislation to limit antibiotic pollution into rivers. We urged collaboration, and we can take inspiration from public-private sector collaboration on COVID-19, and how that's shown us that we can do this. We can look to communities that are learning and sharing best practices, like the creative school clubs, educating children about superbugs in Dodoma, Tanzania. We advocated for investors to use their power to leverage sustainability behaviors that mitigate AMR and integrate AMR into their decision making. And I'm so proud of the 14 investors who've contributed to the investor action on AMR initiative. I hope more investors from across the world will join our initiative to enhance the global response. Finally, the IACG recommended global governance was needed to turn commitments into action. That's why I, we, as members of the Global Leaders Group, stand before you today. We've got to go further, faster, together. And honestly, we owe it to those who've lost their lives to this acute pandemic of COVID-19 and the healthcare heroes who battle every day to keep us safe, to stand up, that we prepare for the silent pandemic of AMR. So our children and our children's children inherit sustainable health, food and environmental systems. We're here to show the strength of multilateral collaborative action and innovation. We're here to engage with youth across the world whose future are fighting for, now to find the momentum we need. We can see with COVID-19 what happens when we aren't prepared. We've been hearing in this previous session but we can decide right now that our legacy should be to never let it happen again. And as the previous session emphasized, we need good data. So this summer, a world first study will estimate the burden of AMR worldwide with an evidence base that will help make the pandemic visible. And we mustn't let inequity define the next decade. Instead, innovation and collaboration must drive our resolve to deliver the SDGs so that's really why I and the whole Global Leaders Group are standing up for our people and our planet. Let's make it that our generation is the one that saved modern medicine, not the generation that lost it. Thank you. Thank you to Professor Davies uh, speaking to us from Cambridge. Our next panellist is Ms. Sunita Narayan, uh, Director General of the Centre for Science and Environment, a public interest research and advocacy organisation based in New Delhi, where, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has taken on explosive proportions in the last number of weeks. Our thoughts are certainly with them right now. Ms. Sunita Narayan, over to you, please. Thank you, Sherwin. And uh, thank you, President of the Assembly and Your Excellencies. Um, it is really an honor to be here with you and to talk to you today um, about a crisis which I believe, and I think as my co-panelists have so powerfully explained to you would be as catastrophic as the COVID-19 pandemic, which is in our faces today, or climate change. I'm an environmentalist. I work in Delhi. I work at the interface of environment and development. And I can see the impacts of climate change happening today. When I went for the, to the Rio conference in 1992, climate change seemed so far away. And yet we can see its impacts happening today in our lives. And we can see the impact on the very poor of our world. And that really is why we need to address this other 
what I what Dame Sally has so rightly called the silent pandemic, the pandemic which is not so obvious to us today, but is has the potential to be as catastrophic. As an environmentalist working in India, for me, COVID-19 has highlighted issues which I believe will guide us in the future, which will help us to map the work that we do when it comes to uh, AMR as well. One, we have understood the value of global interdependence and cooperation. We know that we are as strong as our weakest link. We know this when it comes to climate change. We know this today when it comes to COVID-19. We know that if we do not vaccinate everybody in the world, we remain in danger of the pandemic. And so this is equally crucial when it comes to antimicrobial resistance. We need to work together. We need to find answers together. So the value of global interdependence and cooperation is critical in these, um, in these challenges. The second, we have understood the value of inclusive growth. Countries like mine have the challenge of access to antimicrobials. We need to provide life-saving medicines to all. This needs medicines to be affordable and to be available. And at the same time, we have the challenge of excess. We need to make sure that use is sustainable and safe. And this is really the balance that as an environmentalist, we know that this is the big balance that we need to find and fast. And thirdly, the value of nature. If COVID-19 is a result of our dystopian relationship with nature, we also know that AMR is about the overuse or unsafe use of antimicrobials for humans. But it is also about the way we are growing our food from crops to livestock and the discharge of its waste into the environment. So the value of nature, which COVID-19 has brought to us so sharply, is something which is embedded in the challenge of AMR. And this is why my organization, me, we have been engaged, I have been working in this for the past 30 odd years. And for us, the challenge is to find pathways to growth in which we do not first pollute and then clean up. It does not work for the emerging world, for my part of the world. And I dare say it does not work for the already rich world to first contaminate and then to clean up. So prevention, conservation becomes as critical as development. And this then becomes the priority, finding affordable pathways to growth and development that will work for all and the planet. And that is why I am really privileged to be part of this group to, to bring to bear the issues of environment and affordability. Um, and I hope we will work together. Thank you. Sunita and Narayan, uh, you took us back to the era of the wireless. Your audio was fantastic, but you didn't turn on your camera for us, and we'd love to see you. So if you don't mind, please turn on your camera. Thank you for that intervention. Allow me now to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Scott Wees, a professor at the University of Guelph, director of the Center for Public Health and Zoonosis. Zoonosis, if you didn't know, is a disease that can be transmitted to humans from animals. Do you hear that? It's the sound of our collective genius improving. Dr. Weiss is also the Chief of Infection Control at Ontario Veterinary College, member of the Global Leaders Group. Sir, over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Sherman. Uh, Sherman. As an infectious disease veterinarian, uh, researcher, and educator who focuses on AMR as well as antimicrobial use, emerging diseases, and as you said, diseases at the human-animal interface, I see the various challenges that we face. And I have to answer different masters. We're trying to improve human health, animal health, and environmental health. From the animal side, we have to balance a lot of issues, concerns, and priorities. Animal health, animal welfare, food production, food safety, food security, economics from large-scale production down to small-scale subsistence farming, working animals that remain the tractors of some societies and we forget about, and the human-animal bond with companion animals who undeniably support human health and welfare, especially in some of these difficult times. 
And we need to do that while mitigating the risks to human health and the environment. Animals play myriad critical roles in society and for individuals, and we need effective therapies for them. But antibiotic use in them undeniably creates risk. There's no easy answer, but I think we can say that current practices in all sectors are untenable. Antibiotics are a finite resource, not because we have limits in our ability to make them, but limits in how long they'll be effective. Every time an antibiotic goes into a person or an animal or enters the environment, we continue down this pathway to more resistance. We're creating conditions where this epidemic of AMR will flourish. We're driving unsustainable practices in all One Health sectors. We're mortgaging planetary health with limited plan or maybe ability to pay for it. And our children will pay for it. We're paying for it now, but they're gonna pay for it more unless we act. How much they pay depends on what we do now. We need to use antimicrobials in humans and animals. There's no doubt about that. We just need to use them better. And we need to reduce our reliance on them through preventing disease. This is a complex ecological problem and it requires a complex ecological solution or solutions. It can't be fixed by addressing one facet or one sector or be done by one agency. It needs to be addressed by a broad, multidisciplinary, multi-sector, collaborative, one health approach. We need significant, sustained, sustainable, equitable, effective approaches to maintain access to these miracle drugs, to maximize human and animal health while minimizing any negative impacts on humans, animals, and the environment. And I'm very happy to be here as part of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rees. We'll return to you during the question time in just a moment. Last but by no means least, let's listen to Professor C.O. Onyekbuchi Chukwu, former Nigerian Minister of Health, Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at Alex Ekuweme Federal University in Dufu Alike, and a member of the Global Leaders Group on AMR. Professor Onyekbuchi Chukwu, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Sherwin. Um, the President of the UN General Assembly, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, let me thank the President of General Assembly for convening uh, this very important global interactive uh, dialogue. And I want to also thank uh, His Excellency for inviting me uh, to be a panelist on this occasion. Um, I'm a medical doctor, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and so I prescribe antibiotics. So I know what the problem is all about. I know how it hurts the patient, and even hurts me, hurts my reputation, when what you prescribe doesn't seem to work, despite all the evidence that shows that it should work. We know the problem we have. And luckily for me, I have this can-do spirit, and I'm happy to be in this community of can-do guys, people who want to achieve things for the world. I'm ready. And why do I say that? I'm a living witness. Globally, we're able to eradicate smallpox. We did it. And coming nearer home in Nigeria, we dealt with Guinea worm. I was minister when that certificate was given to us at the World Health Organization. And that first pandemic as a minister, I fought Ebola. And we did dealt with it in Nigeria the way it should be dealt with. These are no easy tasks. But when you have the will, it can be done. As minister, I was so much interested about what happens to regulation on medicine, the issue of counterfeit, fake, substandard, and adulterated medicine. These are part of the problem. So working with my colleagues on the World Health Assembly, and even at the United Nations, at the African Union, we continue to push initiatives and policies that will address this ill. I was also the minister in Nigeria that started working on what I call the national prescription policy. Uh, doctors, pharmacists, and others who prescribe and who have to deal with medicines must decide what are the indications for these antimicrobials. And coming from Nigeria, we have a problem with malaria. And we do know what resistance of plasmodium to the available antimalarials did to the fight against malaria. We're only just beginning to come back to the fight. So we have a problem on our hands. We have another pandemic, which we need to all work together. It can be done. But let's remember one thing. 
it's good to fight as a team. I'm happy it's all about one health. Everybody's on board. We're not in silos. But let's also remember the differences, the divide around the world, the socioeconomic divide. We need to pick lessons from the ongoing COVID pandemic, from the discussions and conversations regarding vaccine. We need to work ahead and know that all parts of the world are not equally endowed socioeconomically. So even if we do well in some countries and we neglect others, you know why I'm saying this? Then, as you know, disease does not respect your boundaries. Disease doesn't require a visa. Nobody will be safe until every part of the globe is safe. Thank you. Thank you to Professor Anya Bucci Chukwe for that final opening intervention. And I like what you say. Let's fight as a team. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll be very, very, I'm very, very grateful, and uh, as we all should be, that we have these panelists as part of our team members. Let's do a quick round of questions, Dr. Hanan Balki. How has this momentum from the 2016 UN high level meeting on tackling AMR been sustained across One Health sectors, particularly through the work of the tripartite? And what is needed to close any gaps that may exist? Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to my colleagues for the, the great comments and very personalized ones and, and experiences. I think, as, as we heard earlier, the ICG came to a conclusion early in 2019. And since then, we've been uh, very much aware that the world is watching how the major organizations are going to respond to the ICG. And I think we came um, to action quite quickly, despite that there was already collaboration between the agencies, the tripartite included including UNEP and many others. But the establishment of, uh, based on the request from the Secretary General, whom we presented to him the report of the IECG uh, in early 2019, was very keen. And in fact, I was very touched, and, and Sally remembers this very clearly, when he actually shared his own personal uh, experience with antimicrobial resistance. If you ask anybody in any setting that you're in, they have been touched by this menace one way or another. The Secretary General shared that with us as well. And he was very keen that the recommendations of the IECG go forward very quickly. The, the uh, leaders of the agencies were very keen on moving this forward quickly. The, um, multi, the uh, tripartite joint secretariat was established. And I think we, uh, as uh, members in this agency, uh, agencies are extremely proud about the extreme collaboration, communication, uh, and uh, work that we've been doing together. And we still have more to do, and we will continue to do a lot more uh, among the four of us and others as well. I think of significant achievement um, over the past 18 months, uh, and I will mention a few, not all of them, but was the establishment of a five-year joint uh, strategic framework um, that will be finalized soon that will actually address how are we going to prioritize, how, we, how are we going to institutionalize and include the actions needed by the tripartite within the systems, as you've heard from our colleagues uh, from Scott, complex ecological problem requiring a complex solution. And also that if we want to do this, we had to show to the world and to the countries and at regional and country level that these agencies can work together and with their collective intelligence and effort and norms and standards can move uh, the um, move work forward. The other thing that was done uh, is the tripartite antimicrobial resistance country self-assessment survey, very long uh, word, summarized in the acronym of TRACS. It has been operational and operated since 2017. It is part of the overall tripartite monitoring and evaluation framework for AMR, which is extremely cross-cutting, multi-sectorial, and uh, established a set of core indicators across the One Health spectrum. Extremely important and useful for countries to adopt for their national uh, AMR uh, plans and for their to monitor. The, the, the other issue was that was developed is the tripartite technical guidance on WASH, which is water and sanitation at the healthcare facility, as well as wastewater management to reduce the spread of AMR, uh, has also been published for the member states to use. Uh, a very good uh, reference uh, that was done jointly and, again, has major impact. Um, 
As mentioned earlier, the Global Leaders Group, which we are hanging huge, huge hopes, and I do not want to put pressure on my colleagues, but we are really looking forward to the Global Leaders Group to establish their KPIs and their work agenda. And we have sensed, even from the very first session from today, uh, two sessions ago, uh, from the, uh, the co-chairman uh, of the Global Leaders Group, their enthusiasm, and also my colleagues with me on this panel and the previous panel. So. This is extremely important. The AMR Multi-Partner Trust Fund has been established as well to support collaborative tripartite action. I think this is one of the entities that has, I don't want to sp say speed of light, but it's establishments and uh, the, um, uh, do the donors were extremely uh, kind to have uh, provided the initial seed money for this. And we've already established uh, several global programs and many uh, activities and grants from at least 11 countries around the world. Um, key steps have also been taken in establishing other global governance, and hopefully uh, soon news will be heard about this, about the independent panel on evidence and the partnership platform, the two of excuse me, the two other global governance uh, uh, entities that were mentioned by Sally earlier, which is part of the IACG. In order to close uh, any gaps, the tripartite organizations and UNEP are extremely committed to further strengthen our support to this global response. All of us are extremely passionate about this agenda item. The work is intricate, and the multi-sectoral uh, and needs coordination and partnership at national, regional, and global level is extremely needed. We're very grateful for the increasing discussion uh, in our governing bodies about AMR, and we look forward to the continued support of our member states to ensure sustainable financing is available for these important functions. We are ready and um, extremely um, enthusiastic about supporting our member states and helping them establish the multi-sectoral work that is needed. The Global Leaders Group can also contribute and hopefully will contribute to this by keeping AMR high on the political agenda, advocating for sustainable financing for the AMR activities, which is part of its vision and priorities being shared here today. Uh, uh, this is just a summary. There, on our, all of our websites, you can find more information um, uh, that I hope that you can refer to. Sherwin, I'll give it back to you. A lot of uh, detail there, Dr. Balki, and a lot of work that clearly needs uh, to be done in the road on the road ahead. We thank you for that intervention, Professor Davies. Let me bring you back in. What progress has we made thus far in achieving? those goals laid out by the IACG recommendations two years ago, and what are the major challenges that need to be addressed in three minutes or less, please? Thank you, yes. So while that was going on in a bubble, um, not enough has happened in countries. We have lost momentum, and I really think COVID's given it back to us, and the Global Leaders Group, with its advocacy, has a real role to play. I do think we've made progress on seeing this as one health and of recognizing the role of the environment and everywhere we need responsible and sustainable use of these drugs and access. But we need this independent panel to happen. And I'd really like it to be able to take questions from the Global Leaders Group and answer them from us. Their work will help us set targets. They will help the Global Leaders Group look at accountability I think the Global Leaders Group can play a key role in ensuring that AMR is in any pandemic treaty across the globe, as is being discussed about. It's our opportunity. It is the slow pandemic. A lot of people are talking about it. We've got to make this happen. We also need to invite in the private sector and work with them, not just for innovation, new diagnostics, new drugs and things like that, better ways of doing surveillance. But actually, AMR is cross-sectoral. It's a macroeconomic issue, so it needs investment. And we need AMR-friendly investment. And I'm thrilled about the World Bank applying an AMR lens, which ISCG recommended to their investments and lending, as does the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and the UK CDC, and I encourage other investors to join the Investor Action on AMR initiative. 
We are doing stuff through multilateral collaboration. Germany led the G20 when in 2017, when health ministers discussed it. 2019, joint health and finance ministers discussed it. We, in the UK's G7 presidency this year, are prioritizing tackling AMR and exploring innovative approaches. And I hope that G7 countries will be um, ambitious. We need to be. Let me stop there. Professor Davies, thank you. It's a macroeconomic issue. We need AMR-friendly investment. And of course, when we talk about the uh, costs associated with inaction, the price goes up. Uh, Ms. Sunita Narayan, uh, what is the guiding vision of the Global Leaders Group? Uh, it's short-term objectives, probably two to three years, and mechanisms to ensure that the group is accountable to these commitments. It's also good to see you. Thank you, Sherwin. And can you see me now? And can you hear me now? Absolutely. Before it's good I to see you. That's what, that, that's what the okay. point was. <laughs> thank you. And I'm sorry about the glitch earlier. Um, thank you for asking this. And uh, thank you for my co-panelists for laying out the need for urgency and also the agenda that we need to take on. So the objective of the GLG or the Gro Global Leaders Group um, and our guiding vision is really to maintain and to heighten the political momentum and visibility of the urgency of the AMR challenge on both at the global and at the national agenda. So we will be an independent, we are an independent group, but with the aim to really try and cajole, to push and to catalyze that action um, and, and for us, the key vision is to ensure that we can work with the one health approach. And this, in short, means that we need to prioritize actions at the global and at the national levels on human, animal, crop and environment. And this is often easier said than done. We know that our agencies at the national level are often work in different silos. So how do we guide that action at the national level that can work both at the human, animal, crop, and environment level, and what needs to be done? And that's really the role that uh, GLG hopes to play. Um, our objective also is to emphasize the need for prevention so that we can minimize the use of antimicrobials through infection control. And this is where the agenda for clean water, for sanitation, for waste management, and for food systems that work for livelihoods and nature comes in. So it's not just about antimicrobials, but it's about how do you prevent and minimize the use. And that really brings in all the other agendas together as well, whether it is clean water, as I said, or food systems. And therefore, it is about responsible and sustainable use of micro antimicrobials through human health, animal health, food, and plant. But we also recognize in all this that we will need global and national actions on AMR that is guided by science and risk-based data on surveillance and monitoring of antimicrobial use and resistance across all sectors. We also recognize that we will need to look at and understand better the pathways when it comes to the environmental lens of AMR. And we recognize the need for enhanced funding, which um, um, I think has been spoken about so clearly and so powerfully, because we need enhanced funding that will build capacity of countries to implement the National Action Plan. So given all this, we have developed an action plan for the coming period. Uh, this plan includes uh, looking at how we can sustain political action on AMR by seizing critical opportunities. Um, as as uh, Dame uh, Sally uh, Davis said so correctly, we would like to see uh, the COVID-19 pandemic response and recovery plans uh, to see how that AMR can be embedded in it. Uh, we would like to advocate for a high-level meeting at UN to discuss AMR in 2024-26. And it means engaging with UN agencies, governments, tripartite, and UNEP to guide and catalyze action. And you asked about our accountability mechanism. 
in the plan that we have developed and which has been this very interesting exercise of bringing together all uh, the experts to look at how would we act in the future, we have established the outcomes and developed indicators for, uh, for measuring success of our work. And of course, we will keep reporting on this uh, because we will need to have your support so that we can all succeed in this critical agenda. Ms. Sunita Narayan, thank you for that intervention. And let's not underestimate the heavy lifting that, that's required when we cajole, uh, 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 push and catalyze action, certainly uh, when we talk about uh, getting member states on board. Dr. Jeffrey Scott Wees, how is or how should the Global Leaders Group promote the necessary coordination of action on AMR at all levels of governance, international, regional, national, and local? Over to you. Well, I think we're seeing some great energy and enthusiasm here today. And what the GLG can and must do is harness that and maintain it. As Dame Sally mentioned, momentum loss is a major concern. So there needs to be a push to maintain, to identify and fill the gaps that we've talked about today. As was mentioned earlier, AMR has been called the silent pandemic. And the GLG can play a critical role in ending that silence through championing, advocating, coordinating, providing information, support, and profile. There's a need for coordinated, sustained, and impactful political action, and action being a key word, uh, for broad inclusion of AMR discussions at all levels, which will eventually have an impact at the country level. The GLG can advocate for ensuring that AMR is considered in any global pandemic treaty, uh, a prominent role for AMR discussions in any key global or regional forum, such as G7, G20, regional political economic block meetings, and any relevant high-level health or development meeting. As was mentioned by Sunita, uh, a high-level meeting on AMR at the UN General Assembly is a clear need, and um, the GLG can help advocate for that. Again, this is a complex problem. The GLG can provide help provide an international and whole-of-society approach. As a problem that bridges sectors, disciplines, boundaries, and includes animal health, human health, environmental health, AMR can't be addressed by one country or agency or sector, no matter how motivated or resourced they might be. This has to be a broad effort, has to be a coordinated effort. There needs to be communication. The default approach to AMR must be One Health, and One Health issues must be at the forefront and guide discussions, and the GLG can advocate for a true One Health approach. Uh, the GLG can also advocate for development of global and national targets for responsible and sustainable antimicrobial access and use across all sectors, animal health, uh, human health, food, plant, and environmental ecosystems. And that has to include considerations of differences between regions and sectors. Uh, it'll support global guidance and approaches to harmonize information and activities. And ideally, and, and ultimately we need to do, support those needed evidence-based effective, practical interventions. Thank you. Dr. Weeze, AMR cannot be addressed by one country, one agency or group. It has to be a broad effort, similar, I imagine, to efforts around climate change, the SDGs, but a little, probably a little less so around the intergovernmental negotiations on Security Council reform. Professor Sio Onyabuchi Chukwu, how can we encourage increased collaboration among politicians and high-level government officials and what are the best methods to visualize the benefits and global and regional collaboration uh, to the general public, both at country and at local levels? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, now, I'll wear more of my political hat now. Uh, as I'm also a politician, and I will tell you, politicians have very short attention span. We don't have long attention span, okay? Be distracted. Now, the Global Leaders Group has already mapped out what we're going to do. One of the things we're going to do, we're going to work around collaborating and engaging uh, such high-level groups like the uh, G7. Our leaders are serving prime ministers. It's not going to be too hard. Don't worry. We're going to engage the G20, AU, EU, all those laws, global and regional laws. Already, it is the UN that is conveying this. So we're happy working with the president, and we're work, happy working with the secretary general, and through them, the various representatives of each of the countries. We're going to work with regional groups, um, AU, African Union, ASEAN, 
And then, of course, we are going to ensure that those who take care of politicians, we engage them. I, I don't think there's any prime minister or head of state that does not have, you know, a personal physician. We're going to work with them. I guess we can reach them by letting them know what the problem is all about. They do fall ill. Now, COVID-19 pandemic offers us one of the best opportunities to talk to politicians. Now they know that global security is not only about arms and ammunition. It could be worse. We've seen what has happened with this virus. And the worst thing is that you don't know who is attacking you. You don't know where the direction of attack is coming from. This is the time to talk to politicians. They are all ears now. They want to be free to do their political rallies. We are getting them in because of this pandemic. So we are going to ensure that not only do they buy into the vision of the United Nations, which has been handed over to the Global Leaders Group, we're also going to ensure that they put money where their mouth is. We're going to ensure that resources, it is possible. We're going to work with the ministers in agric, agriculture ministers, ministers of environment. We're going to work with ministers of water resources, ministers of health. All of them, we're going to work with them. Trust us, we're going to do it. Thank you. Professor Anya Bucci Chukwe, I think just to summarize your remarks is that COVID-19 provides us with an inflection point uh, while we have the attention of politicians. Uh, I think that's a fair summary. All right, let's open uh, questions from the floor. I uh, will now open question, uh, questions to member states in the General Assembly. Since there is no established list of speakers, participants are encouraged to engage interactively and avoid reading from written statements. Delegations wishing to speak are, of course, requested to press the microphone button. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Canada. Well, thank you very much, and my thanks as well to the President of the General Assembly for convening us today. Um, let me just pause for a second to say in particular to Ms. Narain. We cannot hear you, uh, Representative. Could you speak closer to the microphone, please? And I think you're allowed to remove your mask when you make an intervention. Keep it on. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes? Go ahead, yeah. All right. Uh, let me once again thank the President of the General Assembly for convening us today. And before I get to my question, um, let me just pause for a second to say to Ms. Narain that um, we are following closely the developments in Delhi across India and across South Asia. Many of us have family members, colleagues, and friends uh, in Delhi, and we pledge our solidarity to you at this really difficult time. Um, let me thank all of the members of the, of, of the panel here today for a really rich discussion, for really modeling what you're recommending, which is a multi-sectoral approach that tries to leverage different expertise across sectors and across region. It was really clear from your presentations how research and policy development and programmatic solutions and data collection are coming together. Um, and it's really clear how the advocacy role that you play to us, to us member states, um, is having an impact. I think I counted over a century's worth of experience across all of your uh, all of your professional backgrounds, and it's really up to us to try to take that forward and take and understand uh, what you're advocating. So I'll, I'll just push you a little bit because I was so thrilled to hear so much focus on the economic dimensions of AMR. And I heard in particular a recommendation that we should embed AMR in economic recovery plans. And my question is very simple. If any of you or each of you can provide a practical and specific recommendation about how AMR can indeed be embedded in economic recovery plans that we should be taking back to our governments, that would really be fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Distinguished Representative of Canada. We'll get to answers in a little bit. Let's hear from the Distinguished Representative of Switzerland now. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you very much for the interesting presentations to the panel. I uh, would have a question regarding the environmental sector, because currently in, in many fora, uh, tripartite at the UN level, the EU, AMR1 health network, etc. We talk about the need to include the environmental sector in AMR strategies and national action plans. Uh, Switzerland supports an increased engagement 
of the environmental sector and an increased collaboration of the organizations involved in this issue. This is also important from the perspective of the One Health approach in terms of pandemic preparedness. So how can this engagement of the environmental sector be achieved in a concrete and sustainable way? And how is the UN system supporting it? I would be very glad if you could uh, give us a few inputs on this. Thank you very much. I thank the distinguished representative of Switzerland. Uh, so let's go back to the panel. I'm going to pick someone to answer the question from the representative of Canada, uh, question regarding recommendations on how AMR can be embedded into uh, economic recovery plans. Perhaps I should start with the politician in Nigeria. Professor? Your audio, Professor. Yes, thank you. We're, we're going to engage. It's, it's not as easy usually to put certain health-related issues on budgets, particularly in developing countries. But if we engage them rightly, like I suggested earlier, engage the leaders, uh, presidents and prime ministers, engage the ministers of the various um, uh, MR sectors, agri, environment, health, uh, water resources, and so on and so forth. It is possible for us, now that we are trying to strengthen health systems in various countries, working for the um, sustainable development goals. Uh, right now, all the members of the United Nations do have an uh, internal budget for things that speak to uh, the SDGs. Now, MR is part of the issues about the SDGs. We can never achieve universal health coverage, data can we achieve the SDGs without having pharmaceutical interventions. There's no way anybody is going to do that without medicines, without uh, vaccines. So it is the work we're going to do, not only with the presidents and prime ministers, but more importantly with the ministers, that will enable us now to begin to include this in uh, budgets. National, uh, every national plan should be funded, should be budgeted for, there's no point having national plans that are not costed, for instance. So the first thing is to ensure that national plans are costed and that we have included what should be costed in them. Then at the country level, there must be established uh, communities of practice. It is the communities of practice that also help us as key stakeholders you know, to advocate uh, for increased internal funding uh, for uh, matters that relate to antimicrobial resistance. So that's how we're going to do it. Thank you, Professor Chukwu. I saw uh, Dr. Valky also nodding earlier. Would you like to make an intervention on that question? No, the next, the second question, not the economic. I'll take the environment. Any, anyone else want to go on the first one? Going once? Twice? All right, Dr. Valky, on the second question on the environment. Yeah, I, I think Sally raised her hand if you didn't see her. Uh, go Sally ahead, Professor yeah. For the first question? Well, yeah. Thank you. So embedding AMR in economic recovery, all of us, whatever the uh, level of development and richness we have, needs to fund surveillance, access to drugs, and stewardship on a One Health business for humans, the food system, and environment. And it pays. In one year, we persuaded our general practitioners to reduce prescription by 3%. We saved £90 million pounds or more in that year. For ones that are better off, and we're trying to work on this through G7, we need a transparent supply chain. So we, we know where the pinch points are, whether it's safe, how the environmental standards are for the production of the drugs. We need this. When the Chinese um, manufacturing of PIP-TAS burnt down, taking out 70% of the production of that drug, it cost us more than 90 million in that year in England alone to compensate. We need to know, we need to be able to build back. And then for the richer countries, we need to have innovation in how we fund the research and development and bringing into practice of new drugs. And it's called delinkage. We're trying a pilot in Britain, but we really need to find a way because at the moment the pipeline is empty. 
And that will pay because it will save deaths. And Canada did a wonderful study showing that AMR is already impacting on the GDP through productivity. So I would argue invest to save. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davies. Dr. Wees? Yes, well, I'm far from an economist, but in terms of rebuilding, I think we can think about not rebuilding, but rebuilding it better. We have a rare opportunity to invoke systematic changes. We know there have been issues with inequity, poor systems, changes that persist, or problems that persist just because that's the way we've done it. We can reduce systematic barriers um, to efficiency in action. So I think it's a matter of being creative and not just thinking, how can we get back to where we were last year? Let's get us to where we want to be. AMU, AMU and AMR must be embedded in all those. Dr. Balki, uh, the question from the distinguished representative of Switzerland, please. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the question. It's extremely, definitely important. And maybe I alluded a little bit to the multi-sectorial, but to elaborate a little bit more um, to um, ensure the member states and, again, to uh, the importance of re-emphasizing that the environment is, is an intermediary between humans, animals, uh, and then between pharma, ph pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, farms. So the environment is like a vehicle that can uh, deliver resistance through exposure to, or what we call it, unintended exposure to the waste uh, that carries antimicrobial agents in it and will lead unknowingly to the development of antimicrobial resistance within the, anti, within the bacterial uh, that are carried by humans or by animals and that, or, or even by plants. And then that circulation of antibiotics uh, leads to a more um, aggravated problem. What we have established as, as a multi-agency or multi-organization document is the code of conduct, if you will, emphasizing and putting all of the uh, approved uh, legislation or guidance on keeping the environment clean, uh, uh, codes of practice for the different agencies, uh, were put in one document to help the countries uh, uh, utilize it during establishing their national action plans. And I think that's when we hear the word NAP. NAP is a big umbrella for what needs to be done at the country level. Integrating all of these responses within the national action plan in all of the countries is, is extremely important. Um, uh, another example is during our uh, multi-partner trust fund grant reviews we're seeing and we're coaching the countries in establishing their proposals uh, for these grants to have multi-sectorial uh, projects that actually emphasize on that. Uh, another uh, simple example is something called the International Health Regulations and the Joint External Evaluation that is done for countries to look at their preparedness and readiness for emerging pathogens. Uh, looking into that multi-sectorial work, including the environment, is, is integrated in there. So there are multiple uh, entrances to include the environment in, the, in this extremely uh, intricate multi-sectoral response for AMR. Um, and again, there's lots of examples. There needs to be a lot of coaching, a lot of, uh, I don't want, a lot of um, uh, learning and case studies between the countries because um, some of them are simple solutions and some of them are quite complex. And that's hopefully where we're heading with this. Over All right, thank you. Thank you for that intervention. Uh, and thank you to our member states for intervening from the floor. We have about nine minutes left before the top of the hour. And I want to spend some time uh, uh, with the external stakeholder questions that were submitted in advance. And let me br bring in Sunita Narayan here. A question from Mutiat Adetona the, from the International Veterinary Students Association. Let me read the question. So far, a lot of progress has been made with regard to awareness. However, what other effective plans have been put in place to sensitize those in rural and underdeveloped areas with no access to the digital world? In one minute, 30. Your, your microphone. Okay. I wanted to also take up the question of environment that the Honorable Delegate of um, Switzerland had asked. I think it's very important for us to integrate environment into the plans at the ground level. And what we are finding is difficult is really to find the approaches that will work 
for countries in the emerging world because for us affordability of those technologies of the solutions are the ones that become much more critical we talk about waste disposal from pharma industry we need good monitoring systems those are expensive how do you contain the waste from pharma industry what are the standards which will be affordable how do you make sure that the poultry waste that comes out which is reused by farmers is actually not contaminated with the antimicrobial uh, resistant bacteria and this is really where the question also becomes critical when you come to education in terms of the world which is not connected to the digital world because those veterinarians actually know reality they know the traditional wisdom of the farming communities they know the food systems approach which actually works for poor farmers so that they will not use antibiotics because those are easy convenient but they will find other approaches so that they can minimize diseases and i think the most important thing that we need to do is not to straddle the veterinarians in the rural non digital world with our knowledge only but to listen to them and incorporate their learning into how we teach it back and i think that's where in in some senses we should know that we may be very digital we may be connected to the digital world and we are resource rich but we are very illiterate when it comes to the ways of nature and the people who work with nature maybe they're very poor but they are actually very literate so we should not we should look at that knowledge differently that's an excellent point let's start in the rural areas and not in new york Professor Chukwu uh, Robert Scob of the International Center for AMR Solutions asks this although there has been progress in national action plans how will the global leader group uh, advocate for the implementation of these plans and for context specific solutions that can help and support global efforts to tackle AMR 90 seconds um so the global leaders group appreciates uh, that is not there's no single side that is all um we're going to encourage a lot of surveys uh, surveys uh, to decide um what are those communication priorities for different regions for different countries so once we have that uh, body of evidence we can then go to work uh one way is to ensure that Uh, key stakeholders uh uh key stakeholders uh professionals um the ministries uh civil society um the politicians themselves we, we first need to address them and uh, also get you know uh, their buy in now the communication will be have to be appropriate for each kind of locality it cannot be the same for everywhere so how we craft our messages who speak to the local culture and the local dynamics uh, for instance in a place like nigeria to just talk about antimicrobial resistance you probably excite the interest of only professionals if you are looking for the general public you may have to label it the way we did for female circumcision female circumcision is called female genital mutilation so that sends some message so in this case to put craft some and say this is antimicrobial resistance infection antimicrobial resistance pandemic and so people begin to look at it as something they need to uh, work against so communication is going to be key but you based on evidence we have of what will be the priority for communication in each different country and uh, we also need uh, to engage uh, the different countries in terms of their national plans we need to support them uh, you know get international international aid they just need to have external financing options to support this uh, national plans as well thank you professor chukwu uh, chukwu we have one uh, time for one more question and i'm going to throw that one to dr wees and then give our two other panelists the final word uh, mebish by 
Vaishnav from the Disease Management Association of India writes, the rate of resistance to ciprofloxacin, a critically important antibiotic, varies from 8.4% to 92.9% in 33 reporting countries. Similarly, different regions showed varied rates of resistance to various antibiotics. Shouldn't the indicators for AMR be region-specific? In 90 seconds, if you can. Yeah, I think it was mentioned in the earlier panel that knowledge is power in the context of surveillance. And, and that's very true, but only if it's accurate in the forms, guides, or assesses action. And targets are part of that, absolutely. But they're dependent on good information. Uh, the GLG, as I mentioned before, has recognized the importance of, of surveillance and global targets. Measurements of actions, our current status, and, and progress are really critical, but those measurements have to be evidence-based, repeatable, and lead to further action. So proper and prefer preferably standardized surveillance is critical to establish targets. And that requires coordinated discussion because there can be profound differences as per this question between regions, between sectors, and even within regions and within sectors, there isn't a one size fits all target, but there can be a broader approach. And I think that's where the GLG can come in looking at improving surveillance coordinating surveillance, coordinating discussion, coordinating approach to targets, global approaches that can then be applied differentially so that they're appropriate and equitable for different areas. Professor Davies, a final word? Thank you. Well, I'd say to everyone, each of us has a role to play in antimicrobial resistance in our personal lives and through work. And it's time we stop leaving it to someone else even though it is complicated. Meanwhile, we need to empower youth to lead this. After all, the future is here, but it's just getting worse. So what do we need? We need commitment from everyone, followed by action. We need public commitment. We need private sector commitment. We need political commitment, which can sort regulations and really sort the funding. I know that I want to pass on a sustainable health system, a sustainable food system, and a sustainable planet to the next generation. So next generation, look at climate change. Stand up and be counted. Help us get this right for you and your children. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Davies. Final word to Dr. Balki. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sherwin. I think I want to maybe... Um, speak from the heart in my last uh, 60 seconds or what so. Thank you for the attention, for being here. I mean, for all the member states, this is the first step, I think, um, or a positive step that the engagement, you're engaged. And I, I want to also focus on what Chikwi said about the, uh, the attention span. Uh, I know the attention span is short, but I, I think that it's important that all of you do not despair. We want the politicians not to be afraid of the topic of AMR. As complex and difficult as it sounds, if you really uh, dissect it down, it's three main areas. Infection control and hygiene, antibiotic use and proper use, and laboratory capacity building and diagnostics. Those three basics are the basics for the COVID response. They have been the basics for every single pandemic and outbreak that we got. Investment and putting uh, resources into those three main areas will solve the AMR problem, but it will also go beyond that. So please, 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 um, focusing on AMR should not be complex. The basics for preventing disease transmission is quite similar across. I think um, that's my final uh, and, uh, statement, and thank you very, very much for, for the organization and, and being with us. I think we're actually right on time. Dr. Hanan Balki, Professor Dame Sally Davies, uh, Ms. Sunita Narayan, Dr. Jeffrey Scott Wees, Professor Sio Onyabuchi Chukwu, thank you so very much for sharing your expertise with us. It's now my pleasure to hand over to the Vice President of the General Assembly, His Excellency Aksultan Atayeba, the Permanent Representative of Turkmenistan. Thank you, everyone. It was a true pleasure being with you all. Thank you so much. Great. Yes, thanks. It was great. Good start.
и всех участников за активное участие в работе. All uh, of the participants and their very valuable uh, um, insights and contribution to the deliberations of this important matter. Now, before concluding, I want to remind you that the panel discussion three will take place at 3 p.m. in this room. Uh, I'd like to make an announcement. Before adjourning the meeting, I would like to call the attention of members to the letter circulated on uh, 1st of April 2021, which has information regarding the Occupational Safety and Health Plan for this meeting, including the possibility of follow-up in the unfortunate and hopefully unlikely event of a case of COVID-19. Following the arrangements in recent meetings, the Secretariat will actively manage the exit by calling each row for departure in a staggered manner. Members are therefore requested to remain seated after the adjournment of the meeting. The meeting is adjourned. I would now kindly request the delegates to leave the GA hall according to the following staggered plan. First, I call on the delegates seated in the first row from Iceland to Italy. Next, from Jamaica to Latvia to leave the hall one by one. Now from Lebanon to Mali to leave the hall one by one. From Malta to Myanmar to leave one by one. <laughs> 